Good evening, those in the boardroom and those who are listening to us virtually. I'd like to open the Board of Education regular board meeting for Tuesday, April 9th, 2024. And it looks like we do have a request to speak on a closed session item. Yes, we have one virtual public commenter for C1 Superintendent's Evaluation, Kelly Savio. Do we have Kelly Savio? Hello. Hello. Welcome. Hi, are you, you can hear me. Yes. Is that right? Thanks. Okay. Um, good afternoon, board members. Um, in recent years, I've appreciated what seems to be a conscientious, conscientious effort on the board's part to have increased transparency in district operations and board procedures. And I believe that the board also desires healthy communication between all stakeholders in our district, which includes district administrators, site administrators, teachers, classified staff, parents, and students. And the establishment of the student board member position is a perfect example of this. And I've heard President Sims Moten make comments countless times to the effect of, let's make sure we communicate this with the public, or let's fix this so that it's clear for people to understand, or let's be transparent about this. Um, and I have the shared belief that stakeholder input and clear, robust communication is vital to the health of our district and the quality of our work. And so it's frustrating that the stakeholder input has not been a part of our district cabinet's performance reviews since Dr. Matsuoka's retirement. So without getting input from stakeholders such as teachers, you're working with incomplete information when giving these performance reviews. How do you know the ways that district administrators such as Dr. Maldonado have helped support teachers or where there are issues that need to be addressed that you haven't asked us about? So when Dr. Matsuoka was superintendent, he'd send out feedback forms to certificated staff and other st stakeholders asking about job performance. And it helped him identify what was working well and where there were issues that needed to be addressed. Without a system like this in place, how can you be confident in your assessment of our district leadership's job performances? And how can you know if there are any problems that have gone on for years without any resolution simply because no one has asked? Please return to the former system or one similar to it in order to ensure that you're giving the most accurate feedback possible to our district leadership. Thank you. Thank you. That's the only public comment. Um, for closed session items. Okay, there goes the school bell. <laughs> Thank you for that. With no further request to speak, we will now adjourn to closed session. Good evening. Good evening in the boardroom and to those who are watching us virtually. Uh, welcome to the April 9th Board of Trustees meeting. I'd like to call us to order at this point and now we will go to language access. Thank you very much. We have interpretation into Spanish and ASL, and it's available here in the boardroom and also through Zoom. Buenas tardes. Tenemos interpretación al español por si alguien gusta escuchar la presentación en español. Gracias. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Maldonado. Please lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. Please rise and face the flag. Put your right hand over your heart. Ready? Begin. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, there was no action taken in closed session, and we will not have a student board member report uh, this evening because our Anastasia is out sick, and we wish her well quickly to recover, as well as board member Munoz will not be with us tonight. We wish them well, and hopefully they're recovering soon. So next we'll move to the superintendent's report. Good afternoon, everyone, board members. Um, we're gonna start our superintendent report in a second. Today we wanna start with sharing some of the senior highlights campaign that you may have noticed in our social media. This campaign aims to celebrate the remarkable achievements of the class of 2024. Seniors from all high schools in our district are represented in this campaign. By highlighting their resilience, we acknowledge the challenges they have overcome and the perseverance they've demonstrated through their high school journey. We'd like to share four of those students with you here today. The first one is Amaya Hernandez. She is from Santa, uh, excuse me, Dos Pueblos High School. Amaya is an outstanding and involved student at Santa Barbara, sorry, I apologize. She's at Santa Barbara High School. 
Uh, anyone can see her either helping other students with their academics, organizing multiple school-wide events, including the Honor Society, and actively participating in a school port sport herself while also supporting other sporting events. And these students, by the way, are nominated by their school administrators. Next, Lucas Ginder from Dos Pueblos High School. He has brought a new level of energy to the school. He is, has amazing school spirit and is extremely creative in finding new ways to get students involved at games and including everyone in keeping things positive and supportive. He also knows how to finish the job and that he helps to set up and clean up after events. Thank you, Lucas. From um, Alta Vista, sorry. Uh, this is from La Cuesta. My apologies, everyone. I have very small font happening here. Ale Garcia Flores is an amazing woman and student. She's an integral part of the school community and she's a very helpful, friendly classmate. She's dedicated to her education and is graduating a year early. This fall, she will attend CSU Channel Islands with a major in mathematics. When she's not studying or working, she enjoys staying, working out and staying fit. She enjoys sports and being active with her adorable dog. She has an amazing collection of records. Listening to different types of music is Alice's most enjoyable activity. And finally, from San Marcos High School, Viviana Galindo. Viviana has maintained an overall GPA of 4.63 while taking demanding courses offered at San Marcos High School, including honors, advanced placement, and dual enrollment courses through SBCC. In addition, she will have completed two CTE pathways in her high school career. She is dedicated to making the world a better place and helping others. Viviana recognizes the opportunities that she has been given as a first-generation Latina student. We're very proud of these uh, students, and we want to take time to recognize them in our campaign to recognize as we get, believe it or not, closer and closer to graduation date, which is coming fast. Next, I'd like to share with the report some of the work we've been doing both at school sites and in the, our departments around budget and staffing development. Go back one slide, please. Right there. Uh, I want to start off by uh, acknowledging some of the factors that have been impacting a lot of the staffing for 24, 25 school year. We know and we have uh, informed the staff and the board and others that we did come to the end of ESSER funds, which created some reduction in force, uh, which created the need to have reduction in force. We also had the end of a college and career grant, and we made a decision to not renew the early ed grant. That was due to low enrollment in that program, and we knew that we had uh, money in other grants that could cover the benefits that families received in early ed. We know that labor negotiations will impact some of this uh, staffing when we look at potential salary and benefits increases. And on the positive news, we know that there's a bridge tentative agreement on class size for 24-25, which has allowed us to maintain the staffing at uh, the school sites and not have any disruption when it comes to that. We also know that our LCAP ended and we are in a new LCAP cycle. So I know that there's concerns and worries about whether or not we'll get that in time to make sure that we inform people about the upcoming staffing and we believe that we're pretty confident that we'll be able to get that done and informed and planned out as we prepare for adopting our final budget. And then of course there's also the issue of the state budget, which I'll talk to you in a little bit uh, in a couple of more slides. Next, I want you to know that some of the current work, we could go to the next slide please. Current work underway as we look at this season of budgeting and staffing, which is typical at this time of the year, of course the things that I just mentioned that impact uh, our staffing and budget are a little out of the ordinary for us, it's a perfect storm. But nonetheless, our principals and department leads have, uh, have already been given their budgets for next year. And their, their task since the time they were given the budgets till the mid-April, just about mid-April, are to develop, to start developing their budgets and their investments by looking at their data, meeting with their stakeholders, their site councils and others to determine what it is that they'll need to invest on based on their student outcomes and other factors. 
principals and counselors are also working on master schedules already and staffing. They've gotten student requests for next year, and they're working to figure out how to ensure that they offer enough seats with enough core classes as well as electives to ensure that students get a well-rounded education. And that's in, uh, in happening now. We know that the master schedule starts to get developed, but doesn't really get fully implemented till August. So a lot of these things are projections and assumptions that we're making as we continue to build budgets and staffing. And then, of course, the LCAP development is underway. Uh, you know that our goals are based around the three areas of academics behavior, social, emotional wellness, and climate and culture. And if we can go to the next slide right away, please. I do want to remind everyone that there is time to give us feedback. There is a survey that went out before spring break. Uh, there's a QR code there. I see some people already pulling out their phones. You can give us uh, feedback in English or Spanish. The feedback will help inform what's, what are, will be the programs, actions, and services that should be included in the new LCAP. The survey includes current data around the areas that I just mentioned so that as people go to fill out the survey, they can use the data in that area to inform themselves of what's next. So I'd like to encourage everyone, tell your friends, your neighbors, we want to hear from everybody. This is not just for Santa Barbara Unified Staff or parents, and, and, and it's a community uh, engagement with the LCAP. And so lastly, with, with regards to uh, budget and staffing development, next slide, please, Sandra. Um, we did ask leaders to make some cuts when in preparation of all these upcoming um, potential changes. In many ways, our district is going through a, a major reorganization in terms of the way we think of the services we've been offering and what's next now that we've had uh, all these changes to funding. Uh, they were asked to reduce 15% in books and supplies and 20% in services and contracts. I will say that we're already finding out from some of our service providers that the costs to their services are rising. Whether it's the tech industry with some of the platforms that they sell to us, our learning platform, our apps, things that we put on our iPads, our laptops, and then of course the cost of food. We saw that there is a PO this week or today coming to the board um, of rising costs in the food industry as well. So uh, even though we have these cuts that we're asking to make, I just want to make sure that we are all aware of these challenges to rising costs in services and contracts. Next, um, I did participate in a webinar. On uh, where, where the governor's, uh, go ahead, the next where the governor is offered to the state legislature is standing, and that is that they are proposing to reduce the budget shortfall by approximately $17.3 billion. Some of the solutions offered by the governor you can see here. Reductions of $3.6 billion, revenue borrowing, delays, fund shifts, and deferrals. Under reductions, they're looking at, for example, savings from sweeping the money, the salaries from vacant positions. Um, the school facility aid program is looking at $500 million, $500 million cuts. Uh, the, there's a program called the Watershed Climate Resilience. Those are some of the reductions that they're proposing. Under the delays, for example, the $3.1 billion, they're looking at preschool TK and full day kindergarten facilities grant program delays. Wow. We know that we've been implementing TK. Uh, there was an investment of $550 million there that they're looking to delay. California Jobs First, $183.3 million, for example, is looking to be delayed. Broadband, last mile, $100 million. I'm just reading off a few. I sent you the letter on these. Um, under revenue borrowing, they're looking at managed care organization tax, $3.8 billion. AIDS, drug assistance program, rebate fund loan, $500 million. Fund shifts, they're looking at uh, greenhouse gas reduction fund, $1.8 billion. Medi-Cal rebate special fund reserve, $162.7 million. Employment training fund for UI interest payments. And under deferrals, uh, they're proposing statewide payroll deferrals and UC and CSU deferrals. So not a big hit to the education in K-12 budget, but nonetheless, just to give you a sense of what is happening at the state level. 
they look they mentioned in that webinar that it they may uh, come to an agreement as early as the end of this week so more to come when it comes to the state budget and we've shared with you here uh, even though we're a community aid school district the way that the state budget impacts us is when it comes to the special education fund food transportation and others where we get money uh, but we always have to end up making up the difference because it's never enough to cover the costs of those services. Um, next, I wanted to let the board know that we are planning summer school uh, already for J uh, June 24th to July 19th. Summer school including ESY, a special program for our emergent multilingual and dual language immersion program students, and then of course our general ed uh, population you can see here we're going to be uh, hosting it at Cleveland McKinley and Santa Barbara Community Academy uh, so we do have some applicants already for those jobs teachers as well as principals so thank you for those that are stepping up to do some summer school work with us uh, we are going to do next our TK roundup uh, the date to be determined but we're looking at uh, believe uh, looking for Ed or Kenya May-ish to uh, do some outreach to families so that they can learn more about the TK programs, uh, provide information on how to enroll in schools and resources to families so that you can be on the lookout for that. Um, with that said, I am inviting a guest speaker with me today, Ms. Edison, our amazing Assistant Superintendent of School Services. As you know, we did ask people to give us feedback on our climate and culture through the brand new Panorama Survey. It's the first time we've done a survey that is uh, one in the fall and one in the spring. And I asked her to just give you a little bit of highlights of, of the results. And that was students, families, and staff. Thank you. Um, again, this is, we are doing it twice a year. So we did it in the fall and we, we're doing it in the summer. Panorama is a little different in that it gives the responses in the positive. So it talks about um, families or students or staff re reporting favorably to a result. And I'll point that out in just a moment. I pulled out just a couple of data points for each subgroup. There's a lot of data you'll be hearing and seeing that as presentations are coming forward because we have tons of information um, from all stakeholders. For our students, um, just highlighting three areas where we had growth, which are supportive relationships, as we really focus on ensuring that students have a positive adults or trusted adults at school and home. That overall band of questions, that's that, that large band that says supportive relationships. There's many questions questions in that ban. Um, but that overall ban rose two percentage points, which is great. We want always to go on the positive. To the side of that, to the right, you see where it says um, at school or at home. Those are the percentage of students reporting to having a trusted adult or someone they can go to for support and, and care. 77% of our students reported at school they have a trusted adult, and 92% of our students reported at home they have trusted adults. Either way, both of those went up, so we're excited about progress um, and our progress monitoring. We mem remember as part of our MTSS um, practices as we use data to uh, guide decisions, so moving in the uh, positive direction is great. We also are really focused on the emotional and mental well-being of our students and wellness. So we all, some of our questions ask about positive feelings that they've experienced in the last week. Um, to the, so we, that went up 2%, so 56% of our students overall when, you, when they average out the band of questions. But I pulled out just three of the questions to the right there. 79% of our students re, uh, favorably responded to being excited in the last week. 58% happy in the last week, 60% loved in the last week. Again, all of those are, are percentage points in the right direction, that's progress. Um, and this is just since the fall administration. And then for our elementary students around rigorous expectations, that um, band of questions rose four percentage points since the fall. Um, I do want to highlight the work that's going on in elementary with the adoption of the new curriculum, with um, district-wide PLCs and, and teaching practices and sharing all that great work that they do amongst each other. So you can see the band of questions that are in that rigorous expectations just as a sample for you. Um, nine percentage points. How often does your teacher make you explain your answer? That's a big leap for just from fall to, to now, and you can read the rest of those, but we have progress, which is great. Next slide. These are from our family surveys. Um, again, you can see at the top, 
and I missed it on the last slide, but I'll let you know our goal is 80%. We had 72% or 74% in the fall. We had 78.2%, I believe, just this spring. So we are almost at our goal of 80%. Um, we we'll always want to go above it, but 80% is our mark that we're reaching for. So for our families, we had 820 families respond in the fall, and we have 593 res uh, respond this spring. Um, barriers to engagement, that's talking about barriers for them to engage at the school. That went up 1%, which means they're having a positive experience. Those negative barriers are not present. School climate um, went up 1%. And then school safety went up 9%. This is, again, remember um, questioning our, our students and families three through 12th grade, right? So this is all of our school sites. How often do you worry about violence at your child's school? Remember I said it asked the questions for a positive response. 63% uh, of our families said almost never or only once in a while. That's considered positive. That went up 17 uh, percentage points. Um, if a student is bullied at your school, um, how difficult is it for him or her to receive help from an adult at school? That went up 8%, which means 74% of our family says it's not at all difficult or slightly difficult. Those are positive answers. Next slide. And this is staff teacher survey for staff. Um, uh, belonging went up 4% from to 65%, so we're excited about that. Teachers educating all students, as we know, we focus equity. Equity isn't a destination, it's how we, uh, the lens we apply on our work. And as you, as you can see, that went up five percentage points. And then you can see the band of questions that it was asked. Um, how easy do I feel interacting with students at your school site who are from different cultural backgrounds than your own? That went up 5% to 87%. These are the types of questions you'll see as we bring forth our oversight committee work and as we're measuring how are we better off because of the work. It really is implementation data as well as perception data. So these are just some of the sample questions in Panorama. There is a lot, and you'll be seeing a lot of that data. Thank you, Ms. Edison. Next, we, did, uh, we know that yesterday was a very exciting day, so I'm going to ask Sandra to play a video of just a couple schools that we got to visit uh, and hear what students experience with a once in every 20 some years event. did ask a student, uh, how old are you? And he said, I'm 10. And I said, well, the next time you'll see one of these, you'll be 31. He's like, oh, wow. I don't know if I'll still be here, but I didn't tell him that. Next, uh, we want to just turn our attention to our Every Child, Every Chance, Every Day. And as you know, this is part of our initiative to really look at and highlight the different things that people do throughout our district. Uh, so we're going to start off with a new kind of uh, nomination. This is from La Cumbre Junior High. Kyler, David, Esmeralda, and Warren, the La Cumbre Math PLC team. They were nominated as a dedicated group of teachers who work tirelessly to build relationships with students. This helps lessen math anxiety and create safe spaces and motivational environments for our students. They do performances for our monthly spirit assemblies to help build our fun school culture, to, build, to help build our fun school culture. Um, I love that they're making math fun. And I do want to note, make a note that a PLC meeting together to talk about what works for kids is part of the every child, right? That's a group of people coming together to make every child, every chance, every day come true. Uh, from Harding University School, Megan and Natalie uh, take on leadership, school, leadership roles in the school. Their more recent endeavor has been to lead grades four and six in aligning agreements around tier one small group instruction and tier two intervention practices. They see a need, jump in with a well thought out plan and inspire their colleagues to take action. So congratulations to Megan Natalie. From San Marcos High School, Becca. She's the MTSS TOSA who dedicates each day to, each day to identifying students in need of assistance, using a variety of data and formulating 
excuse me, <coughs> ways to help them. <clears throat> she is tireless in her advocacy and refuses to let barriers stop her. She has transformed the experience of lots of students through her work one kid at a time. Thank you, Becca. From Cleveland Elementary, Jessica leads her grade level PLC to analyze data in order to inform her teaching. She's consistently, she consistently has her students create self-monitoring monitoring goals so they can monitor their own progress. Jessica makes herself available to her colleagues to support their technology implementation as a tech lead. And from Roosevelt, Daniel uh, coached the Roosevelt AOK students in basketball. Students learned a lot for the game and benefited from his warm and patient coaching style. It was the highlight of many of the students' school year. Not only is he loved by students, but Daniel's colleagues appreciate his warm and welcoming attitude. And lastly, from Adams Elementary, Mr. Ojeda, Carlos Ojeda, is a compassionate and dedicated teacher who ensures that every student's voice is heard, their needs are met, they feel cared for and feel successful in all that they can do. He promotes a, quote, we can, and quote, environment, and keeps the joy alive in teaching and learning. And so we'll, we'll continue to work on our Every Child, Every Chance campaign. There's lots of things that happen with every child that, that people do, whether it's individually or together. And I welcome all the uh, entries that our school leaders, again, are sharing with us. That concludes my superintendent report. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Maldonado. Now we'll move to public comment. Mr. Escobedo. Yes, we have um, 45 public con commenters for today's agenda, for items that are not on today's agenda. Um, it's good to see you all. Thank you all for your feedback. We want to hear from you. Just as a reminder, uh, everyone will get 90 seconds. It will be up there on the clock to the right of the podium. Uh, and there's also those lights that are on the podium, and it'll turn yellow when there are 20 seconds left. I'm going to try not to interrupt folks, but if people are going over time, I, I may start to give a gentle 20-second reminder. Um, and just as a heads up, if I step out, it's not because I don't want to hear your public comment. Uh, I might get a call that I do have to take, so um, uh, please bear with me. Uh, so first off, we are going to start with virtual public comment. And the first public commenter is going to be Rossini. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, welcome. Excellent. All right, good evening, uh, board members. I spoke to you guys last uh, board meeting about how the surrounding districts to Santa Barbara provide better take-home pay than Santa Barbara does. And my concern that if this continues, we'll continue to lose talented teachers. Um, I sent to each of you an email recently with a video that shows data from the last 10 years and how the district consistently has made annual projections that the revenue would decline as justification for their budgets, only to find at the end of the year that the revenues have increased. And then millions of dollars are put away in reserves. Um, the reserves continued to grow throughout the last 10 years. And as you guys know, teachers are continuing to leave. This tactic of underestimating revenues and not paying teachers more goes on year after year. And I'm here to say that the teachers of Santa Barbara Unified are not asking for a raise the district cannot afford. Property tax income isn't as unpredictable as the district makes it seem. The data is there. Property tax income goes up pretty reliably over time, not down. The district needs to stop lowballing the projections and putting leftover millions into reserves while teachers have to commute hours to get to work or have to work second jobs to make ends meet or make hard financial decisions due to the non-competitive pay of the district. The budget needs to be restructured to prioritize teacher retention and stop adding unnecessarily to the reserves. Students in our district deserve to learn in a district that can retain its educators. Thank you. Thank you. We have one more virtual public commenter, Sherry Bliss. Thank you so much for allowing me to come here and speak today. I'm coming as a parent. Children are served by the district. Um, and I'm coming specifically to ask you to support and approve the multi-year salary increases being requested by the Santa Barbara Teachers Association 
to provide a fair and competitive salary for our SBUSD teachers. I really struggled with what to say tonight because the data and public support that have already been shared at these meetings over the past several months have been so overwhelmingly and objectively in favor of paying our teachers fairly and meeting the salary increase request. So it feels to me like the case has been made and there's not much more to say. Um, to me, the right thing to do is clearly to meet the entirely justified salary increase demands and pay our teachers what they're worth, what's fair and equitable, and what they need to be paid in order to stay in retained, engaged, and here educating our students in Santa Barbara Union School District. What I will add is that this is becoming a national agenda, a critical, urgent priority across the nation because there's there's consensus that teachers are underpaid. underpaid. But in Santa Barbara, where we're the fifth most, most expensive place to live in the United States, and the cost of living is 55% more than it is across the nation, any national improvements are not going to impact us and are going to take too long to actually affect what's happening here in Santa Barbara today. So I'm asking you to lead in this effort and approve the salary increases for our Santa Barbara teachers because they're deserved. Thank you. Uh, if folks have not turned in their public comment slip but want to give public comment, uh, we're going to stop accepting slips in five minutes. So uh, it's 6.42. Um, I'll name the next couple of speakers. So if folks can queue up and if you're in the back, don't feel the need to, to run. We'll wait for you. First up, we have Bethany Guerrero, Guerrera, followed by Carla Hernandez, followed by Haven Bodine. Welcome. Oh, sorry. Okay. Um, good evening. My name is Bethany Wereña. I'm a special education teacher at Santa Barbara Junior High. I teach the literacy class for our dyslexia students. I'm here tonight to speak on behalf of my department and our students with special needs. Um, when I started at Santa Barbara Junior High, in 2019, five years ago, we had 128 students with disabilities, and it kind of fluctuated down to 21, 22, to where we got 107 students with disabilities. And during that time, we had five, six full-time special education teachers. This year, we're at 96 students with disabilities, and we are down to four. So that's a decrease of 11 students, yet a decrease of two full-time teachers. We were told, the numbers don't prove that we need this support. Um, just so you get an idea, we have one teacher who's a mod severe teacher. He has a caseload of 14. The rest of us have caseloads of 27. That's three over the district capped each. Um, and I teach, my classes have to be capped at eight because of research with dyslexia. Um, so that means that 82 of our students are being served by two teachers. In reality, that means students get one special education teacher in their class for 30 minutes a week. That's it. So while the district says that they care about these students, they want to improve outcomes for students with disabilities, that is not what's being prioritized. We keep seeing more leaders in the district get hired, and then we keep losing the people directly supporting these most vulnerable students. Um, so. We're reducing our students to numbers on a page, or the district is anyways, reducing our students to numbers on a page Thank and minutes on an IEP, and we're not viewing them as children with real needs. Please look at our kids, Thank not you. numbers. Thank you. Next, we have Carla Hernandez, followed by Haven Bodine, followed by Caden Dyer. Right. Welcome. Thank you. Um, hello again. So um, I believe I've spoken before about uh, questions. I love questions. I thrive on questions. And I encourage my children to question. Um, and not just to question, but also to look for answers. And so here I am with a few questions for you. And um, just some things I hope you will consider questioning as well. So we re recently received a, did you know, that was signaling the decrease in student enrollment for Santa Barbara Unified and um, how that impacts our budget, of course. But I questioned why the data that was given to us was from like 
10 years ago. Um, and so I, you know, I, I did, I, I questioned it, and then I thought, well, let me look at what it looks like currently. So I went on the California dashboard, which, thank goodness for that. And so I started going through um, looking at enrollment, and yes, Santa Barbara Unified has um, had a decrease in student enrollment. But then I thought, well, are we the only ones um, like having experiences this, and you know, are other districts doing the same thing? And so I looked, and sure enough, like Ventura, they have uh, decreased enrollment by like 2,000 students oh, uh, since 2017, and that's the, how far back it goes. So, um, and then I looked at Santa Maria, Lompoc, Carpinteria, Galita, um, and everybody's pretty much everybody except for Santa Maria has. Um, also experienced this, but they ha somehow have managed to figure out how to fund their budgets, their teachers and uh, other staff. Um, and so I have to question, like, what are they doing and what are we not doing? Um, and so I would up. hope that you would do the same. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have Haven Bodine, followed by Caden Dyer, followed by Rainy Dyer. Welcome. Does he have to push a button? Uh, try talking into the mic and then... Hello? Yep, Hello. you're good. I want to start off by saying that my name is Haven and my teacher doesn't get paid enough. That is not okay. You're telling me that my teacher has to consistently ask for a raise to get your attention? I mean... You gave my teachers the if you gave my teachers the raise they were asking for it still wouldn't be acceptable. My teacher is the best teacher I've ever had. In fact, me and my classmates loved her so much. My principal put us in her class again. So she is my best friend and all my class class and my classmates are also her best friend. There's another teacher at my school who is also my best friend. And he has to have three kids at once and he doesn't get paid enough too. Goodbye and good day. Thank you. <laughs> Welcome, Caden. Hello, my <clears throat> Hello, my name is Caden Dyer and I'm a fifth grader at Monroe Elementary. I'm very confused about why I'm here tonight. I should be at home relaxing, not worrying about my education and my teachers. How can you let them go on like this? You have an obligation to fulfill. You have an obligation to me and the kids and the future of the society. We need an education to be leaders, and my teachers need your support. If you let the teachers go on strike, then you're interfering with my right to an education in my future. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Ne Next up, we have Rainy Dyer, followed by Brissa Rodriguez, followed by Wendy Whitehead. Welcome. Uh, good evening. My name is Rainy Dyer. That was my son who just spoke. I am a Santa Barbara Unified School District, District alumni, and I'm also a parent. I'm appalled that we are here today to speak about this matter again, and I want the board to know how important our teachers are to our community. The entire community stands in solidarity with Santa Barbara, Uni with SBTA, and the district should feel ashamed by this. Please explain why your budget is more important than supporting the people that educate the future of America. Santa Barbara is a community of abundance, and our local school board should have no problem making sure the teachers have the support they need. This conversation shouldn't even exist. Our teachers should feel supported and appreciated by the district at all times. Why would you allow this embarrassment to happen? Why wouldn't you work extra hard to come to an arrangement? I am confident that you will do the right thing and find a way to provide the resources and financial support our teachers are reasonably asking for as soon as possible for the sake of the children of our future and the society. Thank you. Next, we have Brissa Rodriguez, followed by Wendy Whitehead, followed by Sonora Coronado. Welcome. Hello. Hi, 
everyone. My name is Brisa Rodriguez. I'm a freshman at San Marcos High School, and I'm here to talk to you about the importance of youth outreach workers. I am here instead of soccer practice during finals week because this issue is very important to me. A youth out outreach worker is someone who's there to support kids who need it, and especially because I felt that other school staff hasn't been understanding as much as they have. I have had a yacht worker for two years now. Having a yacht worker throughout school has helped me in a way that no one else ever has. In seventh grade, I was going through a difficult time in which I had never felt like I had had any support at school. Having a yacht worker gave me the support that I had always been looking for at school, and I know it has helped others as well. Just today at school, I asked a couple of students who, have, who work with yacht workers how it has helped them. And some students say that a yacht worker has helped them with understanding the meaning of life more, having someone who's available, available to talk with when you need them at their lowest points, and how they find an adult at school they are comfortable with. Some even said that the yacht worker felt like a father figure. This shows a huge importance of yacht workers at school, and I don't think it's fair for you guys to be taking this away from us, and how you guys are always encouraging us to find a support system at school, and now you guys are willing to take that away from us. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have Wendy Whitehead, followed by Sonora Coronado, followed by Kim Barron. Welcome. Hi. Thank you. Um, I've worked here. Oh. I've worked here for 23 years, and yesterday I was forced to retire, and I requested a exit interview with the superintendent on Friday. Then yesterday I was told that that meeting was canceled because she was too busy and to call back. So I called back this morning and I was told by Brenda that the superintendent was too busy to meet with me. And I said, why would that be? And she said, I'm sorry, we're just too busy to meet with you. And I said, well, I requested an exit interview to talk to you about what's going on. And she said, I'm sorry, we're too busy for you to schedule an appointment. So I was wondering what the correct process was in order to schedule an exit interview with the superintendent if I didn't do it correctly. So that's it. And I was told to ask how to get an answer, if you guys can tell me how to get a meeting with her any day at any time to tell her what's been going on with me. Thank you. Thank you. Sonora Coronado, followed by Kim Barron, followed by Kay Cantu. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Hi, I'm Sonora Coronado, the language and literacy coach at Roosevelt Elementary School. My job, simply put, is to coach and support teachers at my site in implementing our new ELA curriculum, as well as support in language and literacy development. I'm up here today to speak up for all of the, of the many other subject area jobs that will no longer be supporting educators in our district, though. As you have already heard from many hurting SBUSD employees, we are frustrated that you have decided to reduce positions such as both secondary and elementary science, instructional support specialists or ISS positions, the secondary social studies ISS position, we do not have an elementary ISS position, both secondary and elementary math ISS positions, MTSS TOSAs, counselors, curriculum specialists, bilingual paraeducators, youth outreach workers, and ETS positions. Any cuts that need to happen should be done as far away from students as possible. However, you, the district, and the board are approving doing the opposite by cutting positions that directly impact our students. By choosing to take bilingual pairs away from students, you are taking away a support to those students that allow newcomers uh, the ability to adapt to their, their new environments with identities that they can best relate to. By taking curriculum specialists away from students, you are taking away strong tier two and tier three academic intervention supports. By taking MTSS TOSAs and counselors away from sites, you are taking away safe adults for students, as well as our youth outreach workers, uh, as well as people who dedicate their time to developing systems of success for our most vulnerable students. By taking away ISS positions, you are removing in-house expertise on coaching, the implementation of tier one, inst 
instruction. In place of that, you will instead have to spend well over what their salaries cost to bring in outside consultants who are less familiar with our district and our culture. <laughs> It's already been proven that you have enough money to save many, if not all, of the positions you have chosen to preemptively reduce. We are optimistic that you will strongly consider the options before you Thank get closer to May 15th. And I really hope that you can Thank prove you. to us that you have students at the center of your priorities. And Thank then, you for your public comment. Thank you. Remember, supporting teachers is supporting your students. Thank, Thank you, you for your time. Next, we have Kim Barron, followed by Kay Cantu, followed by Joel Block. Welcome. Hi, good evening. Um, did you know that a first-year teacher in Santa Barbara makes $58,000 a year? The superintendent makes $337,000 a year, all in with benefits. Did you know a second-year teacher makes $60,000? The assistant superintendent of business services makes 288,000 all in. Did you know a fifth year teacher makes $68,000 a year? The assistant superintendent of human resources makes 277,000 all in. Did you know a 10th year teacher makes $83,000 a year? The chief operating officer makes 274,000. The Assistant Superintendent of Student Family Services makes 244000 and the Assistant Superintendent of Educational Services makes over 215000 Recently, the SB Independent asked our Assistant Superintendent of Business Services if members of the Executive Cabinet be, would be willing to take a pay cut in light of the recent layoff notices that were sent out and the budget cuts that the district is threatening. Her answer was no, because they need to be competitive with other school districts. I cannot begin to express how insulting that was, given that the teacher salaries in Santa Barbara are the lowest in the area. Should we take from that that this school district sees no reason to offer competitive teacher salaries? If you are not willing to take, uh, if they're not willing to take a pay reduction, how about a pledge that they will forego the next salary increase? After all, a 10% raise on 288000 is a heck of a lot of money. Thank you. Thank you for your public comment. <laughs> next, next, we have Kay Cantu, followed by Joel Block, followed by Christina Man Manilai. Good evening. Uh, Kay Cantu, I teach sixth grade at Washington Elementary. I've also been with you for 26 years. In those 26 years, I've had a great many good years, and some of those people that you, you just shared with us were actually my student teachers. So I've done some, some service in between uh, just helping the students in my classroom. But I'm here to talk to you about what's going on in the schools and the teachers and not being able to afford living here in Santa Barbara. As you're aware, we are over by 50% the cost of living than most places in the country. But our salaries don't share the 50%. So as one of the uh, people in my family that brings home the largest paycheck, it's very hard to continue, even in my 26th year, to continue to pay my bills. If you haven't noticed that the inflation is not stopping, but yet our property taxes and our properties are actually increasing. So that's why I'm not sure that I understand how the district can say that they don't have the money to give us our raises. Um, if one thing has taught me by living here in Santa Barbara for over 45 years, it's that property values continue to rise. Yes, there may be a dip here and there, but on the whole, they're gonna go up. So let's be realistic and let's make sure that we have all of our information correct before we're willing to reject a, a much needed raise for our teachers here in Santa Barbara. Thank you. <laughs> Next, we have Joel Block, followed by Christina Manila, followed by Becca Wrench. Welcome. <clears throat> Good evening. I stand before this body to talk about the state of Alt-Ed in our district. Are you aware that La Cuesta, Alta Vista Independent Studies, Gazal, Flex, and Middle College each have a unique student body and unique needs? 
Are you aware that 40% plus of La Cuesta students, 50% plus of Quetzal students, and 10% plus of Avis students are SPED without us receiving equivalent levels of staffing and funding as the other high schools? Are you aware that the district has informed us that if a parent of a SPED student wants a child enrolled in independent studies, we are required to enroll that student even if the IP team believes it is not a proper placement? Are you aware that under district direction, Avis credits attendance only for work turned in on a timely manner, even if a student attends school every day? Are you aware that following that rule, any student who attends every day but only achieves an 82% grade average will be deemed chronically absent? Are you aware that the teachers in Alt-Ed believe that the district uses us as a dumping ground for students it finds difficult to deal with? Are you aware of the fact that of the 50 students I personally teach, 31 have medical issues, 28 are designated English learners, and 5 are SPED, and that number, we're told, will increase? Are you aware that the district refuses to provide Alt-Ed with the necessary personnel and resources? Are you aware that if this continues, the district will be in a position of extreme legal liability on both state and federal levels? Now is when change is needed, not at some future date. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have Christina Manilai, followed by Becca Ranch, followed by Rich Lashua. Welcome. Thank you. So within my two years as a teacher in this district, uh, the phrase multi-tiered systems of support has been emphasized over and over again in alignment with every child, every chance, every day. And yet, as part of the pink slips, many MTSS site positions were removed from school sites. So where are those multi-tiers now? Are they in the ISS or instructional support specialist positions that got eliminated? What about the paraeducators, curriculum specialists, and counselors? In fact, elementary school teachers, we received an email regarding joining a report card committee to alter our report card. Why was the elementary science ISS position eliminated when this very TOSA aligned every assignment with our report card? Why has the elementary math ISS position been eliminated when they created an entire website dedicated to supporting students with state testing alignments and report card standards? According to the Independent, why do the highest people in Santa Barbara need the best people in administrative positions and need to be competitive with other districts, but not teachers. Combining the roles of multiple positions and assigning them to single individuals is silent hiring, which is employee exploitation. So the inequality and injustice in question has been made so visible that it is impossible to ignore. How long can this be? 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 Long can this be? Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have Becca Ranch, followed by Rich Lashua, followed by Heather Grosh. Hi, Welcome. Becca. Hi, I'm going to speak about it, two things tonight. Um, one, I'm speaking as a parent, and I'm sharing an anecdote about my 10th grader at DP. She's had a hard time coming up with what she would like to study in college and future career plans. Thanks to the college and career counselor and the services provided through this office, my daughter has heard from college representatives and from speakers sharing information about different careers. Our 10th grader now has ideas for possible careers. Our family relies on these types of services along with the help of all the counselors at DP. Please don't cut these positions and services. We can't all afford private college counselors. As a parent of children in the district and a certificated staff member, I'm really hopeful that mediation goes well tomorrow. I again ask of you, um, ask you to show the students, staff, and parents that you value them by making it clear to the district office admin to pay what teachers um, are requesting. Despite the um, infos that are sent out of the did you know, uh, the district really does have the money to pay what we're asking at this point. Um, you don't 
I'm speaking to the school board, you don't have to just follow along with what district admin are pushing or what they think is best. You're the ones who direct this district and the admin at the district office is what's best for all of the folks that I just mentioned. So thank you. Appreciate you listening. Thank you. Next, we have Rich Lashua, followed by Heather Grosh, followed by Andrew Southerd. Welcome. Thank you. you. Hear me okay? Yep. Okay. <clears throat> Arts make everything better. Decoramos nuestros cuerpos, son nuestras ropas favoritas. Art infuses the rich architecture that defines Santa Barbara. Leemos historias para entretenernos. We watch movies and TV to escape for a while. Nosotros reímos, lloramos, consideramos las vidas de personas diferentes a nosotros. If you want to improve practically anything, just add music. Encontramos música en una boda, un discurso político, un servicio <coughs> servicioso religioso, manejando un coche. Heck, when we put someone on hold, we know giving them some music helps. Los artes mejoran todo. So why aren't we tripping over ourselves to improve education with more arts? ¿Por qué tenemos un sistema de educación en los artes que favorece a algunos estudiantes y prohibe a otros? At Santa Barbara Junior High, the film program has been eliminated, and multiple conflicting sections of theater and music are being taught by the same teacher in one class period. Why are we so okay with this that other junior highs are moving to similar models next year? Podemos reparar estos problemas si creamos un horario que tiene siete clases para cada estudiante. Tal vez los estudiantes blancos podrían aprender idiomas extranjeros y entender más de la mitad de mi discurso. Thank, Thank you. you. Next, we have Heather Grosh, followed by Andrew Southerd, followed by Liz Lomelli. Welcome. Hello. Tonight I'd like to open with what I feel is the most important question that should guide all decisions our district makes and should unite teachers, the school board, the superintendent, and every employee, especially when difficult choices need to be made. And that is, what is in the best interests of our students? Specifically, what will directly improve each child's social emotional well-being and academic achievement? And research has repeatedly proven that the answer to that question is directly tied to teachers. You'll see different percentages depending where you look, but all show an overwhelming majority of people feel that we, they were positively impacted by a teacher. Studies show that teachers help students through difficult times in their lives, and we've heard from students speaking to that very fact in our district. There are also measurable gains that last beyond elementary and secondary school. A well-known study from Harvard and Columbia found that having a good fourth grade teacher makes students more likely to go to college, and they will earn, on average, adjusted for inflation, almost $35,000 more in their lifetime. The American Psychological Association found that teens who have good supportive relationships with their teachers enjoy better health as adults. Over the past months, you've heard repeatedly from teachers who have to work more than one job, endure long commutes, and struggle with the high cost of living in order to work in our district. And many end up leaving because of these factors. When teachers are dealing with personal stress, it makes it harder for them to give the energy, love, and commitment that they want to their job. The district has to make smarter choices about where to spend their resources. And when the question is, should the district provide competitive salaries to attract and retain highly quali high quality teachers, the answer should undoubtedly be yes. Since it is in the best interest of our students, maintaining quality teachers is, is the surest way to support our students now and give them the best possible advantages in the future. Thank, Thank you. you. Next, we have Andrew Southerd, followed by Liz Lomelli, followed by Daniel Flores. Welcome. Tony Stark once said, it's not about me, it's not about you, it's not even about us. It's about legacy. It's about what we choose to leave behind for future generations. In Boy Scouts, whenever we left a campsite, we would all line up on one side and then slowly walk across and pick up each piece of trash that we saw on the ground. And we would leave that campsite cleaner than we found it. 
without fail every time. It was always cleaner than we found it. Are you going to leave this district in a better place than it was when you got here? Are you listening to what we're telling you? Because our message is pretty clear. Thank you. Next up, we have Liz Lomelli, followed by Daniel Flores, followed by Sarah McLaughlin. Welcome. Hi, good evening, school board and Superintendent Maldonado. My name is Liz Lomelli. This is my 16th year teaching, eighth year teaching math at La Colina, and I also work as La Colina's tech integrator. I came to you today to ask you to reconsider the cuts to ETS personnel. In the digital age, technology is not just a tool, but a fundamental component of modern education. Our school site has 45 teachers, each with two devices. We have 887 students, each with their own iPad. That's over 900 devices. And that doesn't include the devices for other staff, iPad carts, Apple TVs, etc. If you spend any time in a junior high, you know it's a different kind of place iPads get broken, students lock their friends' iPads as a joke, they forget where their iPad is placed, and now it's stuck, stuck on lost mode. We cannot promote ourselves as a technology-driven district and then turn around and cut our IT specialist. By doing so, you will increase tech ticket wait times, which will lead to interruptions in their learning experience. Now picture having a math curriculum pushed in junior high that is mostly digital, and will require a working device. Not to mention those devices need to be charged, but that's a whole different problem. <laughs> Imagine students eager to engage and work in our classrooms left waiting for essential tech support. Their access to content is mostly online and every district and state assessment requires the use of their iPads. If you value technology in our district and the role it will in inevitably play in our students' futures, then you should value those who keep the technology running. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Next, we have Daniel Flores, followed by Sarah McLaughlin, followed by Monique Segura. Welcome. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Board. Um, board President Sims Um Thank you, President Galindo, for inviting uh, us. Oh. We'll restart the clock. Is it on? Check. Yep. Board President Moten, thank you for having us. No. Okay. I'll just, I'll just be loud. That's fine. Board President, uh, thank you for having us. Uh, President Galindo, thank you for inviting me to speak. My name is Daniel Flores. I'm uh, elementary school director with the UEA, and I'm just here to stand with SBTA today. I want them to know that I'm super proud to have signed a resolution supporting the SBTA and what they're doing here today, as well as every single member of our exec board. I want President Galinda to know and all the teachers here that we are going to stand with you now. And if this continues, we are going to be with you until these teachers get the contract they deserve. Prices, yeah. prices are going up, and there's been a lot of conversations about all of the, the prices that are going up and how the salaries are not consistent. They're not keeping up with the amount of inflation that's happening right now. What's, that, what's, that, what's happening there? is as prices go up and the salary doesn't keep up, every single year these teachers are taking a pay cut. And the only silver lining that's happening to this is, is districts like mine are receiving lots of applications from yours. <laughs> the first caller made a uh, comment about reserves, and I don't think there's been enough conversation about that yet, and I want to say that. The board right now has a directive to keep 10% in the reserve. Currently, I'm to understand that your board is keeping 14 with a plan to keep 19% in reserves by 2026. I, if I was a taxpayer in this district, I would want my money going to the students, going to the people that work with those students, <laughs> I, going to Thank books, you. paraeducators. We need a fair settlement now. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Next, we have Sarah McLaughlin, followed by Monique Segura, followed by James Claffey. Hi. Good evening. I am Sarah McLaughlin. I am the president of the Ventura Unified Education Association. 
our association stands together with SBTA. Every student deserves highly skilled and passionate educators. It is outrageous that you are not willing to invest in the very best educators for your students in Santa Barbara. The community in Santa Barbara and the surrounding areas support your, edu your educators and you should too. What message are you sending to the students when you neglect the people whom the students learn from and rely on daily? The dedicated teachers and staff shouldn't have to struggle to live in the community they serve. Being an educator should not be a life sentence of financial stress. If you are serious about giving your students the best possible education, it is time for you to step up, pay your educators a competitive salary without cutting student services. Otherwise, your talented educators will leave you to be a part of other districts in which they are paid better. Our unity is unbreakable, our solidarity is invincible, and our collective action is unstoppable. We will keep fighting together for your students, our profession, and the future of public education. Your students are counting on us. And when we fight, we win. Thank you. Next up, we have Monique Segura, followed by James Claffey, followed by Jose Segura. Yeah. Welcome. Uh, hello. Uh, you can hear me, right? Yeah. Okay, good. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Tara Garamani, and I'm a seventh grader at Santa Barbara Junior High. I understand that, oh, well, first, I'd like to um, tell you that I'm here to express my opinion on the elimination of honors classes. I understand that the elimination of honors classes was meant to create more equality between the students. I am all for equality, but this is something totally different. If our students are capable of greater things, then why not allow them to be? You go on and on about how not even the sky's the limit for our education, but here you are eliminating it. I have collected many signatures of students, teachers, and parents who believe we need more honors classes. Honors classes will help students move at a faster pace. This will be helpful in future classes, according to admish, ad, admission site. All these classes, as these classes often cover the content faster and in greater detail, students gain a strong foundation for future advanced classes, such as advanced placement or AP or international, um, whatever, how you pronounce that, um, IB. Uh, <laughs> Honors classes in junior high will prepare students for AP and IB. AP and IP will prepare them for college and university and make them much easier for students. Thank you. Thank you. Next up, James Claffey, followed by Jose Segura, followed by Brandon Vargas. Good evening. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, I was going to read you a... Uh, a poem in the style of Dr. Seuss in support of our paraeducators. However, after hearing a, a retiring teacher tearfully address you, uh, I, I don't even know where to begin. Uh, it is heartbreaking. It is just so shameful that a servant of this district for so many years is told, I don't have time for you. I don't have time for you. God help us. Where is our heart? Where is the heart of our district? We have seen fifth grade students here. We've seen seventh grade students here. We've seen high school students here. There is no heart in evidence at this moment. The response to a retiring teacher is, my door is open, walk in and we will talk. Now if that is not a response you're able to give, I mean, are you in the right job? I, and I'm being very, very serious. Are you in the right job? 
We are in tears listening to that teacher. In tears. It is the problem that we're dealing with is not pay. It is heart. You can begin with pay, and tomorrow, the right thing to do is to give the teachers what they demand. Thank you. And to put this to bed, and to move forward, and fix the heart of the district together. Thank you. We Mr. can't Fox. do it alone. Thank you. <laughs> Next up, we have Jose Segura, followed by Brandon Vargas, followed by Manuel Gomez. You skipped me. You called me before. It's, oh. I'm Monique Segura. Sorry about that. Welcome. We prepare students for a world that is yet to be created. That is not happening. That is your mission statement, and if this continues, that will not happen. My name is Monique Segura, and I'm the president of the Orchid Educators, San uh, Orchid Educators Association. We are not a basic aid district. We are actually a district who does not do well with LCFF. We do not receive concentration grant money, yet we have agreed with our district to prioritize our educators, those that are with our students every day. We've got a 10% raise last year, we got a 5% raise this year, and every step of the way, we prioritize our educators, as does our superintendent and our board. I ask you, I tell you, and I beg you to settle this and listen to your teachers and get this done. You know they deserve it, you know they need it, and you know you will lose them if you don't. We take every year of service in Orchid, Santa Maria Benita takes every year of service, and your people are coming our way too. Thanks. Thank you. <laughs> next, next up, we have Jose Segura followed by Brandon Vargas, followed by Manuel Gomez. Welcome. Uh, thank you. Uh, good evening, board trustees, superintendent, and my Santa Barbara Teacher Association siblings. My name is Jose Segura, and I am the president of the Santa Maria Elementary Education Association. Can you yeah. pause oh. it? Sorry. There, you can start there you over. Go. Sir, I've been an educator for 23 years. I've been a union president for 11 years, a team negotiator for 10 years, and a resident of the Santa Barbara County for most of my life. I've experienced a lot, I've seen a lot, and I've learned a lot. I know that being a district leader is hard. Being a board member is hard. Being a district administrator is hard. But being a public school educator, a frontline educator or support staff is hands down the hardest. It's no secret that teachers are feeling more and more overworked, underappreciated, and disrespected by those that they work for. But you all can do something about that. You can work with your certificated bargaining teams to improve working conditions, prioritize what ends up on the teacher's plate and their workload, and make sure your educators are provided a fair and livable wage. Your educators should be able to live in the community in which they work. Competitive salaries can help with that. You should be able to recruit and, just as important, retain the educators that you do bring on board. Competitive salaries can help with that. And finally, if times are tough and cuts need to be made, make those cuts as far away from the classroom as possible. Prioritize students and direct student services. Staff appropriately pay competitively, and cut responsibly. SMIA stands with SBTA. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Next up, we have Brandon Vargas, followed by Manuel Gomez, followed by Eder Herrera. Welcome. Good evening. Can you guys hear me? Yeah. All right. Oh. Uh, good evening. Uh, today we stand here. Is the to mic shed on? Light. Hold on one sec. Can you press the mic button? There you go. There you go. Hello. Yep. Okay. Perfect. Thank you. Um, good evening. Today we stand here to shed light on the remarkable achievements uh, ETS so far this school year. Um, as far as today, fifteen thousand eight hundred twenty-seven tickets have been resolved, 
in the 23-24 year. Um, this stance is a testament to the trust and reliance that our staff and students place for our support. This would not be possible without the help of our tech admins, site techs, system and data techs, and help desk. Um, just in the first month of the new school year, staggering 4,910 tickets have been resolved by our dedicated team addressing each concern with commitment and expertise. Currently, for the first time ever, each high school and junior high have dedicated tech. The repercussions of a downsizing are far-reaching. Teachers, once able to rely on their ETS specialists for guidance in resolving their tech issues, will find themselves overwhelmed and under-equipped in adapting an increasingly digital learning environment. Um, students who depend on access to technology for education will face disruptions and limitations in, learning, in their learning experiences. Um, we can resolve those issues by finding alternative ways to budget on the needs and on the wants. Um, in the face of every challenge, our team has risen to the occasion, demonstrating unparalleled dedication and proficiency. Let us find inspiration to keep our commitment to excellence in serving our community. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have Manuel Gomez, followed by Edda Herrera, followed by Daniel Rangel. Good evening. Welcome. Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Manuel Gomez. I'm a tech, tech with ETS. Um, so I've served the students at Santa Barbara Junior High, Roosevelt, and Harding. I'm currently in, in the, the list of reduction of forces. My team members will, have, will be discussing the data that our department um, will discuss the data of our department. I wanted to suggest an alternative to the, to the proposal of cuts. For instance, cutting back on travel requests, cutting back on the amount of food that is ordered for meetings, um, rem remove extra perks for management like mileage and cell phone st uh, stipends. Some management, uh, from what I understand, get an allowance of, uh, for mileage for over $300 a month. Uh, why don't they have to submit uh, their mileage like everyone else? Um, I know that our CTO purchased lunch for us at our monthly meetings um, out of his personal budget. Please look at our alternatives, alternative solutions for saving money and creative solutions before cutting personnel. Good evening. Thank, Thank you. you. Good night. Next up, we have Edda Herrera, followed by Danielle uh, Rangel, followed by Ken Rivas. Welcome. Welcome. Thank you. Can you hear me? Uh, is the mic on? Uh, the green button's on. Yeah. Yeah, all right. Good evening, members of the board and the community. My name is Edda Herrera, IT Support Specialist 1, and I'm here to present some facts about our ETS department. The average IT support technician to device ratio in California is 1,500 devices to one technician. Currently, my position serves 1,800 students' devices per tech with the rate of six to eight tickets per day. That's not including um, teacher devices and, and tech days. With the proposed cuts, we project that number to increase 22 tickets per day. Currently, the wait time for ticket resolution is 42 hours. With the proposed cuts, we project that wait time to increase to 72 hours. Please consider the impacts on our students and their work if these technology cuts go through. This would be devastating to the daily work for our students, teachers, and administrators. If we, if we get cut our positions, which are three for four positions, four field techs. Um, it's teachers and administrators, everybody will wait much longer to get their problems resolved. If a device goes down to a teacher in the middle of class, they would have to wait almost three to four days. And that's devastating. So please consider it. Thank you. <laughs> Danielle Rangel. Followed by Ken Rivas, followed by Finnegan Wright. Welcome. Good evening. Uh, my name is Daniel, and I'm the IT support specialist for Dos Pueblos High School. There are currently eight total field technicians across the district. This year, ETS was able to have a designated field technician at every high school. With a proposed reduction in force, 
ETS will no longer be able to have a designated field technician at each high school. These schools would be added to the workload of the remaining field technicians who already have an average of three school sites. The impact of, redu of <clears throat> sorry. The impact of the reduction in force will greatly impact students and staff members across the district, including the district office. Working closely with students and staff members has allowed us to establish great rapport and build a community that prioritizes our students' overall welfare and academic success. So I ask that the board members and administrators come together to preserve every job possible to ensure that the collective success of our district. We understand that the circumstances are tough, but we need radical and innovative solutions. Thank you. Thank you. Next up, we have Ken Rivas, followed by Finnegan Wright, followed by Kate Lambert. Welcome. Good evening, board members and uh, district administration. I'm here today to, or tonight rather, uh, to just uh, share my support for the ETS folks and all the other classified that are gotten a layoff notice. They call them pink slips. But um, what I want to say about that is that uh, I know a lot of it is precautionary, but I hope to uh, continue to work hard with the district and um, see what we can do to uh, keep a lot of these folks because uh, a lot of them are um, uh, give student support, you know, uh, direct student support. So we got to really figure this thing out and uh, willing to, uh, again, continue to work uh, with the district on uh, ways to do that. Um, as a grandfather, it's also uh, concerns me that we, we get this thing done um, because I have 14 grandkids, and, but three that are in the school district. Yeah, that's a lot. Uh, <laughs> and I'm kind of old, but um, anyhow, I um, appreciate your time and service tonight. And um, that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Next, next up, we have Finnegan Wright, followed by Kate Lambert, followed by Travis Maniak. Maniac. Thank you. All right. Uh, Welcome. Hello. Um, my name is Finnegan Wright. I've been here before. Uh, I've been here for several months in a row now, actually, um, which makes me think of a topic I've been researching a lot in school um, for the IB program because they have you do this big essay. And I learned about uh, apathy and um, this idea of learned helplessness, this idea that when, when people interact with institutions over and over again that, that just don't show any sign of giving, don't show them any concessions, don't give them anything, they sort of, they, they become apathetic. They don't really think that there's any reason for them to, to step forward in their community and try to make the world a better place. In our district, we should be telling students, we should be teaching students that they have the power, they have the ability to create change in the world and make a better future. You know, we prepare students for a world that is yet to be created. We prepare students to create a world that is better for all of them. When you do this, when you force your teachers to come months in a row, when you force students to come months in a row to advocate for just basic, basic pay for them to be able to live in this district and, and they don't see any real change for months on end, you are teaching the students. You're teaching the students. And, and, and I mean, you're doing a, a really great job at teaching them that their institutions don't care. That their institutions will look them straight in the eyes and say, we do not care about your well-being. We do not care about the people that you love. We are okay with you just suffering. And, and that's how it's going to be. I don't think that that's a good lesson to teach students. And I think that if you really want to be able to create a good civic society, which is something that is really important for educative institutions to do, you need to tell students that there is a purpose for them to come and put their voice out there. And what students are hearing from their own actions, from their teachers' actions, is that that is simply not true. That if they come here and they try to make their voice heard, nothing will happen. So change that. Thank you. <laughs> Next up, we have Kate Lambert, followed by Travis Maniach. Followed by Kevin Kelly Mendesh and BJ Lent. Welcome. All right, guys. So today I'm really excited, uh, not only by all the support we have from other unions, uh, but from our community. So we're going to share with you guys the community letter that we got signed. And then we're going to show you signatures. And we're going to show you guys all the businesses that want to support us. So I'm going to start off with the English version. Dear SBUSD, School Board and Superintendent Maldonado, as an integral part of the community, SBUSD provides our students with an excellent education and we want to see that continue. 
Our community needs teachers who can afford to live in the community, not drive an hour or more commuting from neighboring cities. Our students deserve teachers who are in the prime of teaching, not in a constant influx and outflow of new teachers who stay for a year or two and then leave for better paying districts. It is in the community's best interest for SBUSD educators to have a take home pay that meets their basic needs. Please pay teachers, librarians, counselors, nurses, psychologists, SLPs, all staff uh, that see those students on a daily basis enough to live in Santa Barbara. We value our Santa Barbara educators and hope that you will too. Thank you. Next, we have Travis Manyash, followed by Kelly Mendesh, followed by BJ Lint. Welcome. Buenas noches. Como parte integral de la comunidad, el Distrito Escolar Unificado de Santa Barbara proporciona, proporciona a nuestros estudiantes una excelente educación y queremos ver que esto continue, continúe. Nuestra comunidad necesita maestros que puedan vivir en esta comunidad y no que tengan que manejar una hora o más desde ciudades vecinas. Nuestros estudiantes merecen maestros que están en la flor de su vida como educadores, no una constante entrada y salida de nuevos maestros que se quedan por un año o dos y luego se van a distritos con salarios más altos. Urge a la comunidad que los educadores de SBUSD tengan un salario que cubra sus necesidades básicas. Por favor, paguen un salario justo a los maestros, bibliotecarios, consejeros, entrenadores, enfermeras, psicólogos, patólogos del habla y lenguaje y todo el personal que sirve a los estudiantes a diario para que puedan ganar lo, sufic lo sufic suficiente para vivir en Santa Barbara. Valoramos a nuestros educadores de Santa Barbara y esperamos que ustedes también lo hagan. Gracias. Thank you. Next, we have Kelly Mendesh, followed by BJ Lent, followed by Maddie Hardman. Welcome. Good evening. These are some comments that were on the community letter. Oh, oh. yeah. These are some comments that came from the community letter. Um, the first one is from Nicole Powers, a community member and former SD, SBUSD teacher. She said, our teachers and students deserve better. The longer the board waits, the more our teachers and students will suffer. The time is now to do what's right. This next one is from Leslie Goodman, a community member. She says, our students deserve good teachers and good teachers deserve a living wage. This last comment is from Grace Martinez. She was a, a prior student teacher and substitute teacher in the district. This is what she said. I attended UCSB's TEP program in 22-23, and at a fellowship breakfast, I met Superintendent Hilda Maldonado. Instead of conversing with the pool of candidates and persuading them to stay in the district, she kept to herself, and when I asked her what she was doing to support her teachers, she responded along the lines of, these teachers expect me to solve their money issues as if I control the rent of Santa Barbara. Her closed-minded mentality and negative attitude was one of the many red flags of the district that strengthened my decision to not to stay in Santa Barbara Unified. I love Santa Barbara and its community. I very much enjoyed my teaching, student teaching experience and felt an immense love and support from teachers and students at both Santa Barbara High and Goleta Valley Junior High. Teachers in SBUSD are very passionate and encouraging and deserve the respect of a livable wage and workload. SBUSD is doing the opposite of being progressive, and if we want public education to keep its doors open, then there has to be change. There is no other way. Thank you. Next, we have BJ Lent, followed by Maddie Hardman, followed by Diana Castro. Welcome. Hello. I'm here to read three people that um, are supporting our district our teachers in our district. Speaker number one is Alan Gibbons, a Santa Barbara res resident and business owner. I support Santa Barbara educators and the vital role they play in our community. The second one is from Emily Powell, a former Santa Barbara Unified School District certified educator. As a former substitute teacher for the Santa Barbara Unified School District and now a first year language teacher, I chose to leave Santa Barbara despite knowing that there were multiple openings and a high need for Spanish ELD teachers. 
My decision was largely based on the proposed salary, lack of bilingual stipend specifically for language teachers, and a small stipend for having a master's degree. Due to a high cost of living in Santa Barbara and the surrounding areas, I would not have been able to afford li to live independently. I have, been, I have since been hired in a district in the San Jose area making approximately $18,000 a year more as a first year teacher than I would have had if I had chosen to stay in Santa Barbara. The third one is from Richard K. Merrill T. Young, community members and grandparents of Santa Barbara Unified School District students. They said, our future is at stake. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have Maddie Hardman, followed by Diana Castro, followed by Brittany Miner. Welcome. Good evening. Um, I'm Maddie Hardiman, second year teacher at Santa Barbara High. I teach chemistry. I have uh, four comments from the community letter. The first, the best, most credible teacher appreciation is not a letter from the superintendent or a luncheon, but paying a Santa Barbara living wage for all SBUSD teachers so that we don't persist in losing talented teachers who cannot afford to live and start their families here. From Melanie Jacobson, retired SBUSD teacher and SBUSD parent. Second one, educators are the backbone of society. In fact, they create all members of a functioning society. Without respect, good pay, and resources, we are hurting our students and our future. Helen Murdoch, community member and former US SBUSD employee. Third one, I love my job as an SBUSD teacher. I just need to be able to afford to do it here. Please make that possible so that all of us can continue serving our community, raising our community's kids without the stress of financial hardship. Tiffany Stewart, Santa Barbara Unified teacher. Last one, districts all around SB are paid more. Why? Teachers leave SB Unified all the time for better salaries. Nancy Lusk, teacher and SBUSD parent. And I would like to add on my own behalf, my husband and I just applied for a loan for a house purchase and found that our two salaries combined and our hefty savings were not enough. He works in a nonprofit and I make less than he does. Thank you. Next up, we have Diana Castro, followed by Brittany Miner, followed by Deborah Reed. Welcome. Hi, I'm Deanna Castro. I'm here to read a couple comments. Um, Jennifer Tucker, business. Um, Jennifer Tucker, business owner and community member, states that in order for communities to thrive, parents and children need to thrive. That cannot happen if the staff at our schools continues to go unseen, unsupported, and underpaid. If we continue to avoid paying school staff an appropriate wage, we are jeopardizing the wellness of the families in our community, which is unacceptable. It is the responsibility of those in power to do the right thing and do what is best for our community for all stakeholders, not just those with the loudest voices or the biggest wallets. Julie Strand, a concerned parent and citizen, shares, a good, healthy, and functioning community requires quality, well-paid teachers to stay year after year. We can't afford to have any more great teachers leave our district. We love our teachers. Thank you. Thank you. Next up, we have Brittany Miner, followed by Deborah Reed, followed by Leslie Ayala. Welcome. Hi, my name is Brittany Miner. I am a 3-4 elementary teacher at Roosevelt. I also have three comments to read. The first one is from Samantha Lincolnman, um, a former SBUSD teacher, one that didn't, you didn't retain. I taught for the district for just under 10 years and left in 2022. I left because my family could no longer afford SB, and now I'm working part-time in the specific field I used to teach at the high school level and making just as much money part-time. The catalyst for leaving was the low pay and the number of hours I worked. I wanted more time with my family and not to be financially stressed. Unfortunately, to achieve both those things, I had to leave the district and Santa Barbara. The second comment is from Lisa Kroski. 
Our teachers deserve equitable pay and a living wage. Our students deserve teachers who will stay and invest in their students and community. Third comment is by Desmond Gee, community member. We have excellent teachers here. It's expensive to live in Santa Barbara. Pay them enough so that they can stay here. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Next up, we have Deborah Reed, followed by Leslie Ayala, followed by Hosby Galindo. Welcome. My name is Deborah Reed. I'm my 23rd year in special ed in the district. I'm reading from Mitzi Oyendis, Santa Barbara Unified School District. Do better, district. You are doing anything but unifying the district. Victoria Aguirre, community member. Go leader teacher standing in solidarity with the Santa Barbara educators. Alejandra Gutierrez, community member. Teachers are the heart of our community. Give them the raise they deserve. Rochelle Ringer, community member and volunteer. Most educators don't go into it for the money, but they should at least be able to afford to live in communities they serve. This is no longer the case in Santa Barbara. The mass exodus of faithful teachers and leadership is disheartening and alarming. Stephen Dabby, community member. I love the teachers of SB. They deserve the best to live and thrive. Hannah Bangs, business owner. As someone who has gone to Roosevelt, Santa Barbara Junior High, and Santa Barbara High, I would not be where I am today without the incredible teachers behind me and I am full support of a salary increase. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Next we have Leslie Ayala, followed by Hosby Galindo, followed by Maddie Bordowski. Welcome. Good evening, my name is Leslie Ayala. I teach third grade at Adams School and I have some comments by community members. This is from Pia Beck community member, SB resident, business owner, advocate for fair wages and acknowledgement of the importance of educators. Educators are an unfortunately underappreciated and overworked pillar of our society. They play a vital role in who we become, who our children become, how we relate to each other in the world, and the cultural reform we hope for. Their impact has generational consequences and their influence is significant. Minimally, they deserve proportional compensation. Without educators, we cannot possibly do anything we claim to be moving towards as a district, community, or country. Whether you advocate for a clean energy future, technological advances, social change, political reform, human rights, or literally anything else, it rests on the educators who shape the next generation of leaders, innovators, small business owners, academics, scientists, politicians, and humans. To overlook their vital role in humanity is to condemn ourselves, our children, and their children to a future that looks exactly the same as our present or past. Uh, second speaker, our comment, Priya Talwar, community member and former SBUSD teacher. As a teacher, I poured my heart and soul into my classes and students. SBUSD lost me because of the insane amount of expectations put on teachers without support for discipline or even counseling for students and because of a lack of salary or health insurance commensurate with my education and professional training. And last, John E. Douglas, SBUSD, SBUSB parent, retired subteacher. SBUSD teachers deserve pay in line with Santa Barbara cost of living. Thank you. Thank you. Next up, we have Hosby Galindo, followed by Maddie Bordowski, followed by York Shingle. Welcome. Good evening, board, school members, and superintendent. I'm Hosby Galindo, SBTA president. School board. School board, a victory for one union is a victory for all unions. California educators understand this concept, and that is why over 40 locals have signed our resolution of support. SBTA is expecting more units across California to join us in our fight to show support for our cause. On behalf of SBTA, I would like to thank all those chapters. I'm also excited to see that we have some of those associations showing their support and solidarity here tonight. Thank you to those who made the drive and sacrifice to join our fellow educators in our struggle for a living wage. We appreciate you. School board, you received emails from concerned union members who shared graphs showing our decline in enrollment. This decline has been extremely gradual and should not be attributed as a reason for the overwhelming number of rifts and terminated assignments. You received graphs explaining that the 
that reverting to the spending trends of prior years should not be labeled a proposed cut. Overspending in the category of books and supplies and in the category of supplies and other operating services should not be a reason for the overwhelming number of RIFs and terminated assignments. SBTA has posted a video on Instagram explaining SB Unified Revenues. That video shows that the district has had the money for many years to pay teachers a competitive salary. It's important to note that underestimating income while building up reserves has led to underpaid educators. We fully expect the board to look in places other than educators and CSEA positions to solve the problem of teacher retention. Students and educators are depending on you to do better. Thank you for listening and for acting on our shared communication. Thank you. Next up, we have Maddie Bordowski, followed by York Shingle, followed by Tara. Oh, man, I'm going to mess this up. I'll get back to you. <laughs> All right. Um, good evening. I'm so glad I could make it here tonight as I was on a field trip from 10 a.m. until 5.45 this evening. And as soon as the last student was picked up, I headed straight here because I felt that it was important that I address you tonight. Recently, Dr. Maldonado and Dr. Beal came to my school for a site <coughs> visit. After so many board meetings discussing the need to rebuild trust and culture, we felt like this was a step in the right direction. The day after the visit, a photo of the two of you along with our principal and some of our students was posted to the SB Unified Instagram with the caption saying, at Harding, witnessing dedication from students and staff. You are right. We are an incredibly dedicated staff. However, I am unsure how you witnessed that dedication as you did not step foot into any of our grade level classrooms. If you had, you may have seen our preschoolers using real fish to make Japanese fish prints, our TK students observing caterpillars eating the milkweed that they planted for them, our kinders learning foundational skills through rotations, our first graders dissecting fish, our second graders exploring great works of art, our third graders using math games to build their fluency, our fourth graders brainstorming ideas to address threats to our planet, our fifth graders having meaningful conversations around the history of slavery, and our sixth graders adding detail and dialogue to the myths that they have been writing. All of this to say, I, it is, I think it is important that the public recognize that the words on these public-facing accounts are not always reflective of reality. I hope that in the future when you make these site visits, you make it a priority to visit the classrooms and see what is actually happening on campuses instead of a photo opportunity. Thank you. Thank you. Next up, we have York Shingle, followed by Tara Haramani, followed by Kim Tilton. Good evening, board. Good evening. Uh, please pay us enough to live in the community we care for and serve every day. Last month, I came to the board and let you know how the RIF notice process went for the ISSs. In case you think having strong words with our bosses about compassion and empathy, but then still approving the RIF notices solved the problem, it didn't. Your actions didn't match your words. After my last comment, I ended up being called into a meeting with Dr. Maldonado and Dr. Sheffield that went really well. Uh, I felt seen, heard, and valued. It was compassionate and empathetic, which is what I pointed out was lacking last month. I really believed we were making progress in the right direction, and I felt great leaving that meeting. At that point, you had approved reducing five ISS positions, and our boss told us two of those were vacant, so three people would be affected. We knew who two of the three were, but we're waiting to see who the third was. Then the very next morning, both math ISSs were called into the same meeting where they were told that their positions were being eliminated, and there will be one TK-12 math position that they can apply for. That's the Hunger Games. So five positions weren't cut, six were. Three people weren't affected, four were. The, that compassion and empathy I thought were being restored were thrown out the window. Their actions didn't reflect the words of compassion or empathy. At this point, none of our bosses are acknowledging or talking about these cuts. People are still coming up to me, pensively saying, oh, uh, do you have a job? They don't know because we aren't communicating. When I ask about it, we're shut down and told not to worry about those details. It's neither compassionate nor empathetic. So, as of right now, next year, we have no support, TK-12, for social studies, science, or math. Thank you for your public comment. How are you going to fix that? It, you created it. Thank you.
Next up, we have Tara Haramani. And if I got that wrong, please correct me. Kim Tilton, followed by Steven Treyars. Do we have Tara? Tara Haramani? Okay. Oh, was that the student? Okay, thank you. Um, Kim Tilton, followed by Stephen Treyars, followed by Ken Knight. Welcome. Hi. I was here in January where I shared a story about how myself and several other employees found out that we didn't have health care when we tried to attend appointments and were denied. And at that point, I thought, I let them know. I told them. I put out my piece. So I'm asking, what action did the school board take? Did you direct Hilda to resolve this really critical issue as soon as possible? Did you follow up to see what had been done? Or did you just trust the employees that you appointed to take care of it? Because what we've been telling you month after month is that there are many people in the district office who are leaders, who are ineffective. So you might want to know that last week after my second period, when I'm dealing with super anxious kids, ready for their finals, one of my classified staff comes to me very upset, saying, hey, I heard that you're the person to talk to about health care. I want to let you know I'm a chemistry teacher at my high school. This is a man that we dare to pay basically minimum wage to keep our kids safe has multiple jobs. The only reason you'd be a classified staff member in this district is so you can get health care in retirement. We pay them minimum wage to do this job. And he tells me that he's been waiting for over a year for a critical health appointment, which he's supposed to have and was denied when he found out he didn't have health insurance, but he could keep it if he could have $200 on the spot, which he did not have because he makes basically minimum wage. <laughs> And then I found out when I dug deeper, because that's my job, right, to hold everybody accountable who make way more money than me, that he hasn't had health insurance since September of 2023, and he's been paying deductions that entire time. I'm sorry. It makes me so upset. At some point, the, your leaders that are supposed to be protecting us through hiring the most effective, competent leadership that you can find, we depend on you to hold them all accountable. You don't just have a requirement of due diligence and to Thank children, you. you also have it to us as your employees. At some point, it's negligence. At some point, it's gross negligence. And as board members, you're part of that. So I'm begging you, start asking questions, start holding people accountable, and that we deeply need change. Thank you. Next up, Stephen Treyars, and let me know if I got your last name correct. Yeah, it's fine. And then Ken Knight, and followed by Charles Clow. My name is Stephen Treyars. I teach economics and world history, and this is my fifth year in the district. Starting pay in 2019 with a master's degree was $57,700. Today's starting pay with a master's degree is $64,962. This is a 12% increase over five years. The same five-year period, the Department of Labor cited inflation at almost 20%. This is an 8% gap. This means new teachers district get 5% less today. Sorry, 5%, $5,000 less today in real purchasing power. By the way, that's a vocab word we learned in my econ class. Okay? In order to deal with this loss of purchasing power, I, along with the youngest teachers in this district, live in suboptimal living conditions. I currently live in a 278 square foot studio. For context, that is six times smaller than my classroom. While it is convenient for me to walk nine steps across my entire place, the lack of space makes it unsuitable for me to ever create a future family in this town. Okay? I pay 30% of my take-home pay to afford 278 square feet of Santa Barbara housing. To afford anything beyond the necessities and to build up my savings, I must work a second job as a carpenter handyman, which is what I'm wearing right now. Okay? I'm demanding the board figure out a way to both support our teachers a living salary and to support our most neediest students. Okay? This is the best part about doing carpentry, is that I do honest work that creates definitive, definitive, transparent outcomes. I cannot say the same for our district politicians and leaders. Thank you. Thank you. Next, next up, we have...
Ken Knight, followed by Charles Clow, followed by Roberta Ortega. Welcome. I, I have a different topic that what's being discussed here tonight, but it still has long-term impacts to the students and staff. My name is Ken Knight. I'm the volunteer president of Your Children's Trees, a nonprofit organization. I sent your board and staff a March 25th memo to requesting a discussion about a memorandum of understanding between the board and Your Children's Trees, but I received no reply. I can understand why. Um, last year, your, tr your Children's Trees proposed that our organization apply for a planning grant to design green schoolyards and outdoor learning areas to deal with climate change at each of 16 Santa Barbara campuses, and particularly seven schools identified as economically disadvantaged, and bring it back to your board for approval. So uh, your board approved a memorandum of understanding with your Children's Trees that authorized us to apply for a $180,000 grant from CAL FIRE, which we received. Uh, the district did not have to put up any cash, and, and, and the grant budget allocated $20,000 to reimburse uh, the district for employees' time for working on this grant. Well, we started working on the grant uh, along with school committees and district staff and consultants last November. We had preliminary plans but no cost estimates when district staff canceled the MOU on February 8th in a one-paragraph email based on a survey they took. I'm here today asking for the board to review the circumstances surrounding the ending of that MOU with your children's trees. I've only been able to meet with one staff member in two months since I received the email, and that meeting wasn't satisfactory. If the district doesn't want to proceed with the grant or the MOU, then I ask the board to vote on discontinuing the MOU with your children's trees and not leave it to staff. Thank you. Thank you. Charles Clow, did you want to speak on student outcomes? Okay, I'll hold off on this one. Uh, next up, we have Roberta Ortega, followed by Nancy Lusk, followed by Robin Seltzer. Welcome. Good evening. A day in the life of an elementary school teacher, Nancy Lusk. My alarm goes off at 6 a.m. I'm out the door at 7, arriving at my classroom at 7.20. I prep for students for an hour and warmly meet my students and families at the 8.30 bell. All day long, I instruct, I guide, I listen, encourage, redirect, hug, smile, tie shoes, find lost objects, lost pages, and lost friends. I sit down twice. Once to have snack at 10 a.m. and once at lunch. Oftentimes, I'm on my knees so I can be face to face with my first graders at their desks. When the bell rings at 2.37 and after all my students have been picked up or made it to their after school programs, I prepare and organize materials for the next day. I leave at 3.30, come home, eat, snack, maybe exercise. I spend at least an hour before dinner on the computer responding to district emails and school emails. After making dinner with my family, I spend from 8 p.m. to 10 p.m. reading teacher guides, making parent phone calls, planning, correcting student work, doing more work on the computer for school. Now take this day and multiply it by 30 years. Over 850 students I have educated, all re remaining positive, as I am for many children, the stable adult in their lives. Our room is a safe, calm learning environment. As teachers, we give so much of our best to the youth that we touch. In addition to the official job, teachers carry the emotional weight and societal responsibility for every child 24-7, 365 days a year. Please recognize our constant effort and dedication inside and outside the classroom and pay us a much needed raise. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Next up, we have Roberta Ortega. Is Roberta Ortega out there? Roberta Ortega? And then uh, Robin Seltzler? Seltzler? Seltzer. Thank you. Um, and followed by Moni DeWitt. Welcome. 
Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Roberta Ortega. I teach second, third grade. This is my 29th year in the district, and I would like to talk about an interview with the district administration that was published in the Santa Barbara Independent on March 26th. I think other people have referred to it um, when I'm quoting when asked if they consider taking a salary cut Becchio and Hernandez said the district has to be competitive with other school districts um, all of the teachers agree with this we've been saying the same thing since October I did a comparison between our salary schedule and Golia Union on the third salary schedule because many of our new teachers are coming in with master's degrees. And in year one, Goleta teachers make $6,000 more a year. Year two, they make $9,000 more a year. Year three, $9,000 more a year. Year four, $10,000 more a year. Year five, six, seven, eight, and nine, they make $10,000 more a year. When we get to year 11 through 15, they make $12,000 more a year than we do. When you get to year 16 through 20, they make $14,000 more a year than we do. I had to stop at that point because I was getting too upset. And so just from those first 20 years, the Golita teachers are making 213,000 more than we are. And you can see that uh, the other um, districts that have came to speak tonight say they take up to seven years of uh, credit from there. So I don't know why anyone would stay in our district after knowing all of this information, especially since we have to keep coming back every time there's a new um, negotiations to beg you for more money all the time and we are not being competitive with the rest of the school districts. Um, the In the same interview, uh, Dr. Becchio and Hernandez, I'm not sure who they say, they quoted both of them at the same time. Running Unified School District with a $200 million budget and you thousands of employees thought. is not easy and requires the best people in administrative positions, they said. So I'm questioning also if we have the best people in administration Thank positions, you. why do we need to keep hiring consultants to help them do their jobs? Thank you for your Thank public you. comment. <laughs> Next up, we have Robin Seltzer, followed by Moni DeWitt, followed by Michael Millings. Welcome. Hi, um, I'm Robin Seltzer. I've been an English teacher and EML newcomer teacher for 24 years in this district. And there's so many things I would love to talk about, but I only have 90 seconds. So I want to focus on one number. And that number is 53,000. 53,000 is the amount that you guys approved at the last board meeting in March to pay for a professional development for our MTSS staff and equitable conversations. Um, I don't know who that money is going to, but I know that it is not going to our NTSS staff who are amazing and who could probably lead that workshop themselves. I went online and I searched equitable conversations. There are so many great resources here. I don't know why we're paying $53,000 for that service. I also don't know why my bilingual aide who has been serving my students at my school for eight years is getting paid far less than $53,000 a year for her work. She works directly with students. She provides equitable access for them every day to their academic uh, curriculum. She is their trusted adult in many, many cases. She is the first one to know when someone's getting bullied to bring it to our attention so that we can do something about it. Um, we have a second, we have a bilingual curriculum specialist that we finally managed to hire after six months of trying. Um, she has a bachelor's degree. She's paid more than my bilingual aid, even though she just got hired. And after working with us for only four or five weeks, she was given a pink slip. Um, she also does not even make 50 $53,000. Um, where is our money going? Why is it leaving our district? Why isn't it here with the professionals, the people who love our students, who work with our students? Um, if we want equity, we need to put our money where our mouth is, and it needs to be put directly into the people who work directly with our students. Thank you. Thank you. Next up, we have Moni DeWitt, followed by Michael Millings. And that'll be our last public commentary. Welcome. Yeah, um, thank you, board, for this opportunity. Anyway, I'm here to talk to you about LCAP. And basically, like everything we've been hearing is, is the focus really on the unmet needs of our students? You know, in past, I've talked about literacy. We made a very expensive curriculum drop. But we, in order to bring that up, it was like 1.7 million. If our teachers are leaving, all that's leaving with them. And then we had stagnant test scores before the pandemic. Now we have learning loss. And with all these teachers gone, guess who's going to be stuck again? EMLs and students with learning differences. And you'll look at your little student report tonight. 3%, that's right, superintendent, 3% for EMLs. I got it right. 
um, I just want to be sure you're not shaking your head at me again, and only 12% for students with learning differences. These, this should not be normalized. You know, this should be what we're talking about. We're failing these kids. And what happens sometimes, like what happened at LA Unified, you know, around 2017, they got hit with a class action suit, and then the state just said, go help the 13th lowest performing schools. But that doesn't help the kids who had the wound that the school gave. It helps the next batch. And this batch right here, right now, have never been as wounded as they are. And LCAP is getting hijacked. I went in there, and the district had it all pre-printed. And they said, well, that's because we believe in MTSS. And I'm like, aren't we supposed to be discussing this? There was no notice, or there is now. And the amount of discussion that I was allowed to give was on a sticky note that they'll reinterpret. That is not according to California state law. Look up public advocates, and I tell you this as a friend, because you're ripe for a class action suit if you do that. So get on helping the, the students with learning differences, because it'll trash our district that's already in triage. And please, get your heart. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Next up, we have Michael Millings. Welcome. Thank you. Good evening, board members. My name is Michael Millings, and I am the president of the Antelope Valley Teachers Association, a local chapter of CTA consisting of approximately 1,000 teachers, counselors, nurses, and SLPs, and about 120 miles southeast of here. Though we may be 120 miles apart, AVTA stands with, with SBTA. I also come before you tonight as a resident of Ventura. I live in Ventura but I teach in the Antelope Valley. Why? Because the Antelope Valley pays its teachers significantly more than this area. So much more that I can justify my 180 mile round trip commute to work each day. Santa Barbara is a beautiful, wonderful place to live for those able to afford it. But Santa Barbara has become a place where school employees cannot afford to live on the salaries this district provides. Does this board want that? Does this school board want to become a training district, a district where new teachers come and then leave after two to three years to go work for higher paying districts? Or does this district want a competitive salary schedule that enables the district to recruit and retain highly qualified teachers for its students? Thank you. Have a good evening. Thank you. And that concludes public comment. OK, thank you. Thank you. So that concludes our public comment. Thank you for your comments and your participation. We're going to keep this agenda moving. Board members, we're going to do self-care, need self-care as you need it. We're going to move to acceptance of, um, we're going to forego our board comments unless there needs to be some. Okay. All right. Um, so we're going to go to item E, acceptance of donations. If I could have, we'll just pause a minute and let everybody leave. Members, can I have a quick vote on the acceptance of donations for April 9, 2024? I move to accept the donations for April 9, 2024, with gratitude. Motion and second. All in favor, please raise your hand and say aye. 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 Thank you. And we'll move to the consent agenda. Members, are there any items you'd like to pull? I'll move to approve the consent agenda. Okay, so moved. Second. Moved and second. All in favor, please raise your hands and say aye. Aye. Okay. All right. So I know we have a speaker for, um, um, we actually did some agenda management to have our report and discussion agenda. I know there's folks here ready to speak on that item. So if we could go to the student outcomes report. Do have step. Dr. Sheffield. If we could close that door in the back or ask them to quiet down. Thank you. 
Good evening, board president. I'm on, right? Yes. All right. Good evening, board members, Superintendent Maldonado. Um, I'm here tonight to do the student outcomes report. I'm supported in spirit by my colleagues um, that are not able to be here. I do have um, Dr. Deborah Martinez that will be coming up to speak to us also as we speak about our merging multilingual learners. This is our student outcomes report number two. Um, and in this report, we'll, we'll take a look at the uh, data that has happened in the fall, winter, as we start beginning in our spring, spring reports. Next, uh, get the next one. So as we begin our presentation, um, we want to remind everyone of our LCAP goals. And as we move forward, looking at um, preparing our students for being college and career prepared. Um, creating and sustaining a safe and affirming learning environment for our students and families and building capacity in schools and districts and then increasing the percentage of students with disabilities to meet the college and career readiness requirements. Tonight we'll take a look at um, data from the elementary star. We'll look at secondary star data, our emerging, emerging multilingual learners. We'll look at uh, our learning walks update, then our next steps, and then there should be a little bit of information in regards to student and family services. So taking a look at our elementary data, we want to start off by looking at um, our transitional kindergarten through first grade. They take the STAR early literacy uh, exam. And so within that exam, um, our students will take that in September, November, March, and June. So different groups of our students looking at elementary, then we'll look at junior high and then high school. They will take it at different times of the year depending upon their, their calendar. And then for um, grades two through six, we do star reading. So looking at our early literacy uh, data, Going from our fall one to our fall two, um, we do take a look at and see that there has been an increase in our grades kindergarten through first grade in student standards or met uh, or exceeded, and that improvement is by uh, 7%. And so that's the area that we want to look at improving, reducing the number of standards not met and increasing the number of students that meet or exceed the data. As we take a look at our early literacy data from fall one to fall two, we have this disaggregated data um, looking at our different demographic groups and taking a look at our growth. Um, some things to notice that our Hispanic and Latino groups has a uh, uh, 9% growth, which is a great improvement. Our emerging multilingual uh, learning group also shows an 11% growth. So those are things that, that should be noted and we should be proud of. Moving on to our second grade literacy, we see from star fall one to star fall two, and we were able to pull um, our March winter data, and uh, we are able to see that there has been a 5% growth in students that meet or exceed the standards in our STAR reading for second grade. Now we're moving on to STAR reading for grades 3 through 6. And again, we, um, we were able to get some additional data for this group moving into our winter data. Um, ultimately, when we take a look at this data, we see that our students have maintained at 46%. Um, we don't see a decrease, but we are not seeing growth in this area. As we take a look at our disaggregated data, you can see some of the key areas where there is growth. Um, I want to highlight our Hispanic and Latino groups. Uh, they grew by 4%. Um, our socially economically disadvantaged group grew by 
And then as we take an average, you see that that uh, data is staying the same. Moving on to our star math and taking a look at that. Unfortunately, as we take a look at this data, our standards met or exceeded had decreased for our March 8th, our winter data. We had seen growth um, from our initial fall one and fall two, but there was a slight drop in our winter data. Something that we could note, at, as you look at the data from 2023, we are seeing at the same time last year, we do have slight growth in this area. Looking at our grades three through six for math, as we look at the different demographics, we're able to see if there's growth in some of the key areas and, and areas where we may have stayed the same. Something to highlight, our special education group did grow by 3% in STAR math. Now moving on to our uh, STAR testing for grades seven and eight. Um, as we take a look at them, we'll look at the at, uh, data for semester one and then their winter semester two. For our grades nine through 11, we'll look at um, the beginning of the course which is in the fall, the end of the course, which is in the winter. And then we look at data at the beginning of winter and then end, of course, in the spring. Our data for our high schools is different because they are in, um, we have four different terms. And so a student may be taking an English class in terms one or two and not taking one in terms three or four same for math and so it just depends on when they're taking that course and then th when they will take those exams so within grade seven uh, through eight for star reading as we take a look at our data uh, students that met or exceeded from fall one or fall two in our reading area we we did see a decrease in students that met or exceeded uh, the standard Within our disaggregated data, you can take a look at the different demographics um, of our students. At this time, we don't have growth in, in any of the key areas, and um, that would attribute to some of the, um, the loss uh, um, of meeting the standard for our junior high school 7th and 8th grade in reading. Taking a look at our 7th and 8th grade math, um, students that have uh, met or exceeded that did go down by 4%. Moving into our disaggregated data, again, taking a look at the difference of each of the demographics. Moving into our high school grades 9 and 10, so beginning of course and end of course. So the students that have met or exceeded, we did see growth for our students that have met or exceeded in grades nine and 10. As we look at grades nine through 10 for our disaggregated data, you could take a look at those key areas and demographics in which we are showing growth. Something that I'd like to highlight is our reclassified fluent students. They show a growth of 8%. The next set of data is um, in regards to our students being prepared for college and career. Um, this is our uh, 11th grade students meeting A through G benchmark um, for the 20th 223 school year and so what we look at is the key areas that identify the courses that meet A to G and the students that have met or the students that have not met 
And so taking a look at the percentages, um, for example, in A, history, social science, we see the number of students that are meeting that requirement in the 11th grade. Those, that's students that have received a C or better in these different courses. And so we have uh, year 2021, 20, years 21, 22, and years 22, 23. This is another look at uh, students meeting A to G by demographics. And so we just pulled data from our most recent years for 2023 and then 2024. And so overall meeting that requirement is in the blue, not meeting the requirement is in the gold, yellow, or close to meeting that requirement is in the gray. And so you could take a look at those students that are really meeting that standard and those that we need to continue to do work on. And so this is important information as we are placing our students in classes and providing supports. Now I'm gonna have uh, Dr. Martinez come and speak to us about our multilingual learners. Good evening, Dr. Maldonado, um, board members, uh, district office leadership, and community. What I will share with you is the overall LPAC scores um, that were just recently published in the dashboard. Um, I'm also going to show you the LP growth data from the previous um, data that I shared with you in October to the now. And looking at the star by grade level uh, band and also um, EMLs uh, years in the United States. So what you see here, as you know, the um, emergent multilingual learners take the um, language, English language proficiency assessment for California LPAC annually. They do take that like in the spring. And the first uh, circle and the first set of data is your 2021, 2022. And this is what I would call like a snapshot. It's just the status. So you have, um, if you look at the, the first uh, circle with the 19% proficient, uh, those would be those who score level four. And then you move over to level three, you have that 39%. Um, you looked, move to level two, you have a 25.76%. And then obviously then your level one, which is 16%. That's just taking like the status of the students that score and fell within those proficiency levels. Now, if you look over to the right on the 22-23 uh, data, you can see that obviously the number of students who took the assessment is, is slightly less from 1,752 or 1,752 students to 1,654 students on the 22-23 school year. And the status is um, less on the proficient, 18.56. And then when you look over to level three, you have 30%, point seventy one, and then you have go down to level two, you have that 26.84, slightly higher. And then when you go to level one, you have slightly higher, 23.88. That doesn't really tell you much about growth and, and how they did from the previous year to this year, because it's just uh, the overall score of a number of students. Before I take you to the slide that does show, tell us a little bit more about growth, this is uh, just a reminder slide as to what the English language proficiency indicator is, which is the LP. It is the measure that um, we, are, uh, we see in the dashboard. As you can see, there are four LPAC levels, but there are six benchmarks. So LPAC 2 has two benchmarks. You have your LP2L and your LP2H. So if a student is uh, an LP2L one year and then moves over to the LP2H the following year, that would be considered growth. Similarly for LPAC3. So it is aligned with the research. It does take approximately five to seven years to develop a, an additional language. And this is a way in where we track growth. 
so if the child moves from one LP level to the next, then the child is adequately uh, acquiring the language. The first uh, um, slide is just bringing back that same slide I shared with you in October, and that would be the LP growth between the previous two years. It's always comparing two years. And as uh, you can see, we had that 52.8% that, that demonstrated growth, the blue um, percentage. It is also good news when the 30% is maintained. That means that the child moved from LP2L to 2H, maintained that LPAC2, same for LPAC3. And it is also good news when they maintain an LPAC4, which means that they have then not lost that level of acquisition, and perhaps we are working into the reading and, and, and course grades and, and those other factors that contribute to reclassification. This slide now shows uh, the 2023 dashboard LP growth. So we did have less students to assess, so 1,252 students. Uh, we had from that number, 44.4, of our students demonstrated that one LP growth or more. We have the 31.7% that maintained that LPAC 2 or 3, which is very appropriate. And then we have a 1% that maintained that LPAC 4. One of the things to consider is that oftentimes when they already have an LPAC 4, they more than likely have the other indicators. So that percentage will always be smaller only because they probably reclassified. Um, so it's healthy to see that LPAC 2 and LPAC 3 being uh, as, a, as a maintaining that, that level. And um, what, is not, uh, what, it, what is the area for us to uh, concentrate is those that re dec decrease in LP level, which that would be the red arrows. 23% of our learners went down a level, one LP growth or more. We do have the ability to disaggregate who those kids are, and that is part of a conversation our, our leaders are um, have when they look at the data and identifying who those students are so that they're tracked throughout the school year through their MTSS efforts and other just um, awareness of, of how they're developing language. Um, so earlier you did see the overall EML um, score uh, by Dr. Sheffield as she presented that. And this is just to give you an insight about the years. It's always important to note that when you have an EML learner who has been in the country less than three years or within that four to six years, it means differently if we look at the data differently. So I want to draw your attention to the gray bar. The gray bar is all students. Um, so that, that is a repeat or from the previous slides. And if I take you just by one, I know it's a little complex. So if you just look at one grade level, let's look at the grade three, you can see that in the year zero through three, those students who are in grade three, who have been in the US and US schools less than three years, it's, it's very unlikely for them to have the met or exceeding. It's very unlikely. Um, although we did have two students in, in both uh, fall and fall one and fall two. And then when you go to years four through six, we would want to see that number to be higher. And this is where we look then deeper as to where, where how close are they to the meet or how close are they to the meet or exceed or the meet in this case. And the big uh, bulk of our students are in the level just below that. And um, then they reclassify. So then we don't see that because then they're part of the different bucket, which is the reclassified bucket. Similarly for grade four, um, the years in, years in, in, in the school system matters. So you, you won't see very many kids also be at met or exceeding in grade, on any of the grades for that matter. And when you get to fourth and four, four years through six years, then it, it does become a, a level of concern as we get old, as the children get older. But you do notice that once they get to the fifth grade, you have higher percentages. And that is an alignment with their natural um, growth trajectory as they're gaining language, they're gaining literacy. 
So it is expected to see more of our students fall within this fifth grade um, meter exceed. By the time they're in sixth grade, m many of our learners have reclassified. So then you don't see them again. So it's just, this is just a way to look at EMLs from the lens of how many years have they been in the country, or not necessarily the country, just in the school system as many of our students are American children that have just a different language in, in their household. And seventh grade, eighth grade, and um, progressively all the way to 10th grade, you can imagine that the zero to three years is not gonna change. We won't see very many students. Just because they're older doesn't mean that they're gonna accelerate that, that you know, acquisition and literacy. So we don't anticipate that number to be high. Um, once they get to the four to six years, it is a bigger gap as far as when you enter a school system in, in, as a seventh grader or as a fifth grader and the uh, levels of support that are needed are definitely more uh, intensified. We do see a lot of the students who are in the nearly met and below. And this is where we look at our long-term English learners, although obviously after four to six years, then that's when they become at risk in long-term English learners. Um, so that, um, I guess my general statement would be considering the years that the child is in the school system tells you more about whether they're progressing adequately rather than the grade level on, on its own or just the classification EML. This slide is a summary of our re reclassification trajectory. Um, you, as you can see, we have been hovering around the 13, 11%, 14%, 11% again. Um, I don't have the last numbers for this year per se, but we are around the same trajectory uh, when it comes to um, the amount of students that we reclassify. And that would mean they start with us, Santa Barbara Unified, and then it through our system that we reclassify them rather than when they come to us reclassify they're already at the monitoring so these are kids that we reclassify and the kids that come with that reclassification criteria already they're in a different um, data point basically the, it's reclassified monitoring year one reclassified monitoring year two they wouldn't be necessarily on this on this um, chart unless they're ours so that concludes my section, and I'll hand it over back to Dr. Sheffield. So for one of the ways that we are really trying to impact, trying to impact our students and the data and the learning that's happening within the classroom is really to get a good look at what's happening and then allow teachers to be a part of that uh, process, including our ISSs, including our principals. And so... Um, as this year started, we started to implement uh, learning walk cycles. And so we have worked uh, with our school leaders, worked with our ISSs, and identified uh, a way to get this done so it's not intrusive within a class and really be able to gather data uh, within our classrooms. And so there's a process that, that occurs before the walk and that's meeting with the school leaders and visiting with the team. And that team usually includes uh, those that the school leader identifies as people that they would like to include within their walk. Sometimes that includes their MTSS um, TOSA. It might include another teacher. It might include a literacy coach and another teacher. But whoever the, the school identifies as uh, should be a part of their team. It also includes district leadership. That might be um, Dr. Uh, Wilson, Ms. Alvarado, myself, uh, Dr. Martinez, and our instructional sports specialists who have uh, taken on the helm and they really help lead that learning process for the team. So we get there, we, the, the, the meeting is already planned in con, uh, collaboration with the school site. 
Um, they identify the classes that we will walk through and we will divide up into small teams of three or four. Um, and we have established a way for us to visit classes to be not so invasive, to quietly walk in and everyone has a job. There's a timekeeper within that classroom. There is um, someone that is going to be the one that's going to leave a, we try to leave a positive note within that classroom when we talk after we visit and then the others are there as observers. We, we have that in place. We try not to be writing things down too much. We really want to work on whatever the site has identified what they want to work on. And it might be student collaboration. It may include um, student talk, teacher talk. Um, so we have a few uh, areas of, of that they would like us to look at. They have decided what that is, and we take notes on that. Um, after the walk, so we may have visited uh, eight to ten classes. Each group di visits different classes, so it really depends on the size of the school and the number of classes that we can visit. Um, and then we come around to a group reflection. And so within that reflection, we identify strengths, things that we saw that were great. We put those on quick notes, and then we identify opportunities. Where could we enhance what is happening within that class? And then we leave that. Um, we, we put it on the board. We leave the school site team to have a quick discussion amongst themselves. We walk out, allow them to have that discussion, and then we come back in, and then they share some of the next steps that they want to take. And then the fruit of this labor, they talk about the professional learning, the coaching, and the leadership that can happen at the site within this. We, within elementary, we've had um, rounds one and round two. Um, over 240 classes have been visited. Within secondary, we've um, gone in. We've gotten a full cycle of one and almost completely done with uh, round two and um, look forward to having three cycles for elementary and three cycles for secondary. So ongoing efforts to improve student outcomes. And so in our student uh, outcomes report number one, you saw our data from the state. And then student outcomes report number two, we concentrated on our STAR data, those things that are, we are looking at right now that's happening so that we can make some action. So we look at curriculum, instruction, and assessment. Um, I bring you back to uh, the slide that we had in, in number one. Um, some things that I want to highlight, things that we're really concentrating on um, in instruction, really uh, building up our academic conversations, having our students as integral, active learners within the class, and then aligning and implementing Tier 2 for English Language Arts and Math. And so as we speak now, we have really uh, worked with our school sites to build these systems and put them in place. Um, in addition to that, for math, we do have a pilot with IXL Diagnostic Assessment that's happening in our junior high schools. And so those are some key things that we have really worked hard on, and they're actually happening right now so that we can begin to see some differences. And that is the end of our report. Okay, thank you, Dr. Sheffel. I do believe we have one request to speak. Mr. Benning, can you check that one? It's right there on top, I believe. So it should be G1. G1. Yes. Charles Clow. Clow. We can we can do three there okay. we're there so right. mr. Clow go ahead uh, thanks everybody and good evening um, my name is Charles um, I'm speaking tonight uh, in response to the reduction in force notices that went out to some of the instructional support specialists employed by Santa Barbara Unified simply because I mean I know a lot of Mr. Cloud, are you speaking on the student outcomes report? Yeah. Uh, I'm not sure any teachers have taken the time to walk you through how the instructional support specialists support us and our students. And so I figured I could kind of connect those dots for you. Okay. Typically, that's not the case. But go ahead since you're there. 
because we're sticking about the on the uh, student outcomes report, so your comments should be directed to that. But it sounds like it's something else. But you're there, so go ahead, please. I'll try to uh, create the link for you to make it okay. uh, easier to understand. Um, uh, I'm currently winding down my seventh year in Santa Barbara Unified and my ninth year overall. I'm the social studies site leadership representative at San Marcos High School. I serve on the social studies curriculum committee. I've mentored student teachers and beginning teachers in the teacher induction program. This is all to say I have significant experience and assets that I offer my students, my colleagues, my campus, and my community every day, but I don't do this work alone. My number one point of contact throughout my career when it comes to improving my practice has been the social studies instructional support specialist. Whenever I need a new lesson idea, that's who I contact. When I need help implementing a new policy, that's who I contact. Um, when a colleague approaches me about a problem of practice and I don't know the answer, that's who I contact. In short, for any foreseeable thing that concerns what I teach that exists outside of the classroom, I've been blessed to have an expert to go to in order to help my students get the best education that they possibly can. The people in these roles directly contribute to student success every day across all four LCAP goals. Erasing this position would be a monumental mistake. Without these folks, there will be no overarching district collaboration in numerous core academic subjects. Farming out the job bit by bit to teachers will not be effective because you'll get a piecemeal slapdash effort instead of a cohesive and complete one. Asking district personnel or outside consultants to step up and lead would be equally short-sighted since these individuals wouldn't have the relationships that the ISSs do. This brings me to what I see as the most important reason to retain these educators, turnover. When our teachers turn over, new hires have to get brought up to speed on how our district teaches core academic subjects, which is, in essence, student outcomes. This burden falls predominantly on the instructional support specialists. If you choose to discontinue the support, you are making it harder for the teachers who most need the support um, making Santa Barbara Unified an even less attractive place to work and sowing the seeds of even greater turnover and dysfunction going forward. You all can rescind the RIF notices and help student outcomes just by bringing back the instructional support specialists who help us so much. Okay? You can choose to do it. I, I've spoken to you before about how each of these uh, uh, budget issues that presents itself also presents an opportunity and this is one of them. I encourage you to take it because it is student outcomes. If we entrust people to support us and give them the means to do so, students will benefit. Thank you. Thank you. Is there another request? Right, next, yes, we have Hosby Galindo. Okay, thank you. Thank you, board. I just want to echo what Charles Cloud just said. It's so important. Uh, student outcomes, our ISS team, is so important to that. Um, we saw on February 27th a report saying that we need to improve on math, but we're letting the ISSs go. These are the people who help, first and foremost, uh, help adopt textbooks, and we have reduced those to one position, right? That's going to be really hard to bring equity to people when we let go of those very critical positions. For the first time ever, California on the California dashboard, we're going to have science. We need our science tosis to bring that equity that provides that great um, enriching um, help that need to be successful for those student outcomes, and we're letting those go. Same thing is, uh, goes for every single other position that has been let go when it comes to ISS. So we've got our science, we have our history. Talk about we here uh, achieving equity and bringing support for students. History is so important especially in the early years, so people become critical thinkers and they see how all the connections are made. But again, student achievement, we need all these very special people to help us provide that for them, but we're letting them go and we really need to bring them back for the benefit and equity across all sites, not only for students, but also for teachers. Thank you. Thank you. Does that conclude the respect request to speak on that item? Okay, thank you. Thank you. Dr. Sheffield, you'll have to stand there. Board members, comments and questions? I have questions. Ms. Bill. Okay, thank you for the presentation. Um, 
I have questions about um, the report and feedback. So I know that uh, we have a lot of curriculum that we're introducing, and we're also working on our ELA. Um, how is that feedback loop? There are, the, there are the learning walks, and there's implementation. And one of the things that, that I struggle with a little bit is trying to understand at every phase of curriculum and implementation and actually any, any time after, as we are getting the student outcome data, if it is if it's good or not good, whatever, what, how are we integrating our feedback from the teachers? And that is the piece that um, I would like to know, and I don't know if there's a different place to look for it, because when we're looking at these numbers and they're maybe going up a little bit, maybe going up, going down, where's the feedback, why that might be happening? Is it early in the curriculum? Is there a certain support issue that we're not seeing? is, you know, what is going on. So that's what I need to hear along with this data, is why things may not be working or why are they working well, either side. Um, so I, I, I have a couple questions, but do you, do you anything to say about that to me? So as far as feedback, the feedback loop and teachers with data, it, it, we do have a practice in place right now for our professional learning communities. Um, so in our elementary areas, um, our teachers do meet in their grade level PLCs. Um, I personally walk through, seeing them, see how they interact with each other, see how they interact with daily data as well as the star data. Um, and so the expectation is is they are using that hands-on site-specific to identify where they're supporting their students, where they need to add or take away, where they need to absolutely make some changes. And so that is, that is one way that is happening. We also take that data um, and look at that as well as in our junior high and high schools. Again, those PLCs are identified for our teachers to interact and have those conversations so that they can make changes within their classroom. Um, for example, within our Junior high school, we are looking at the data, the math, star data in particular. Let's take a look at that. We were seeing that we needed to do something different. And so an area that we saw that we needed to possibly make changes, and that's where we went into a math, that, that beautiful, wonderful math PLC that you saw at La Cumbre. We went in and we had conversation with the teachers to see what was working and what is not. We had discussions about IXL, which is a curriculum that we use as a support for our students. And so putting in place that IXL diagnostic and then really looking at how that can feed in and support those teachers. So listening to them, saying this is the space that I need to really make sure that this is working and this is how I can support those students that need that tier two support. Again, um, those PLCs are the most important thing that's happening in those key areas. With our English language arts, Elementary is happening the same way. When we go to secondary, that's where we're looking at our tier two opportunities, having those discussions with our teachers in regards to using our Lexia for our tier two intervention. So listening to those teachers, having conversation, working with um, the teachers, working with our ISSs, working with our school leaders. We also have our MTSS uh, district leadership team. We are sharing that data with the district leadership team and starting to have some additional conversations on what we need to do, what needs to stay the same, what needs to make changes. And so really integrating that instructional piece, we are looking at our, uh, our tiered instructional matrix and really identifying what's happening at each of the site and trying to align what's happening so we can have that alignment across the district. So those are some of the things that we're looking at right now. Okay, I'm glad that there is feedback. I guess really my point is, is you know, I'm looking at a bunch of numbers, and yes. I'm seeing them maybe move up, maybe move down. Right. And in a, in a report like that, I, I need feedback, what is happening. Yes. And what I'd like to see is from report to report that something is being addressed and we're moving forward. So right. I want to see that forward momentum right. with kind of this, whether it's a, you know, an addendum to the numbers, to the report saying these are the things we've identified, we're putting things in place. And then the next set of reports, if the number is not moving, we say, did those things get put in place? So really having linear tracking from report to report that we have issues we've identified and we are doing what we need to do 
to have them move forward. Um, and so that's, that's what I would like to see is some sort of discussion. It doesn't have to be extensive saying it's a new curriculum. We're all still learning. We have to beef up our PLC or something didn't really go quite the way we wanted it to. So we're working on that. So just that piece of it, once again, all of us trying to move forward. What do we need? What do we need to do? So, um, so that's what I, I think would help me understand these reports better in a linear way from one report to another six months to six months. Okay, and then that's my next sec sec second question was learning walks, how's that data collected? How's it being compared over time? You know, I know that this is a new thing, but I'm really trying to set a stage for what we're gonna do moving forward. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I hope we have those plans in place. Um, questions about secondary. Um, I was a little confused about this fact that some of the students are taking up, you know, their English during the first part of the year and then math in the second part. If they, are they taking two tests, one at the beginning, because it says spring, winter, but you're at the same time you're saying they may not be taking it in spring. So is each student who's being assessed for reading taking two tests, one at the beginning of their block and one at the end, and it's not necessarily seasonal, it's before and after? Yes. So the expectation okay. is, is that when a student is, so for our high school, because we have four terms, a student might complete their English in terms one and two. So they are supposed to be taking that STAR test at the beginning of the term and then at the end of the term. That does not, that is not the case for all students that are in a grade level. Another might be stay, taking that, that same English one class or, if, or English two or English, you know, whatever level and they take it terms three and four. There are only four classes per term, and so our students do four classes, terms one and two, and four different classes, terms three and four. So every student is not in English all year long. It depends on where their schedule places that course and so, that class. And so they all should take it at the beginning and then at the end. So I, I, my daughter just graduated from high school, so I'm quite aware of how yeah. these things. It's just when it says spring and fall, I'm like, what are we comparing? Is it test one to test two or is it spring and fall? Right. So I, I think in secondary, we're really not looking at a seasonality. We're looking at test one to test two. Correct. And I want to see that change. So I don't know if it should be labeled that way, because like I said, if they don't take it till fall, you know, their test, there's no spring one for them. There's, you know, fall, winter, whatever. Okay, I'm just trying to see if the data reflects what it's supposed to reflect. Um, on the A to G completion requirements, I am curious, and I'm wondering if as a district we're doing this, is we have students complete A to G requirements and we're trying to get them to complete them. But after a student completes A to G, are we tracking what happens to them afterwards? If they do go on to a community college or four-year university, what is happening? Are mm -hmm. we giving them a quality education that allows them to be successful wherever they go? So do we have a system in place where we're tracking that and that data is something that we can look at? So we do work with National Clearinghouse, and that's something that our college and career counselors work with. Actually, myself and the career counselor just went to get some additional detailed information. We had some one-on-one -on -one training on how we can expand the information that we actually gather. But that information does take a look at where our students go after they graduate. What happens? A lot of times we talk about the summer melt. What happens where some will say they're going to a two-year or four-year and then they don't go anywhere. So it is. we do have the National Clearinghouse data. We can get better at it. We are looking at expanding our access to that data, meaning we have to add a few more systems to get more to tell us more information. But yes, we do have that in place. We need some more data to give us more rich uh, information so that we can use it a little bit yeah. better. And this is not part of your report, but I'd be curious if they do go to college, are they able to complete a junior degree, a four-year degree? And it's just making sure that if they do complete it at our schools, that it actually takes them somewhere. They may not go to college, right. but the ones who go to college, I'd like to know that they're able to stay and they're able to complete what they want. And at some point, I'd love to know for the students who don't, was there a reason? Was, was there, were they prepared for college? With and, the and the reason, I don't know if we could identify, but I can tell you that students can opt to do it or opt out. So as a part of our senior exit, 
they will identify whether they want to participate or not. Um, sometimes they don't uh, have a clear understanding of what they're opting in or opting out of. We did identify that as a need to ensure that when our students take their exit survey, they uh, know what they're answering. So we talked about that um, so that we can make sure we do that this year. Um, but as far as rationale, reason for not completing something, that's not that's qualitative data that I don't believe that the National Clearinghouse is collecting, but it is taking a look at trends. Yeah, I don't know since they're probably adults by the time they graduate. I don't know if we are able to contact them, right. the students, obviously not the parents, and ask Correct. them if they, you know, ha what their experience is. I don't know if Steve's lining up behind you to tell me something <laughs> or, or not. <laughs> Good evening. I just wanted to bring a little clarity regarding the high school assessment for STAR specifically. Remember, uh, we shifted from having classes taken throughout the year. So English one would be from beginning of the year to the end of the year. But now we do it with block scheduling. So block one would be from beginning what you were describing as these two terms. So the beginning of the school year all the way to the end of that semester. That's a full class of English. So when we assess STAR for those students, we assess them specifically at the beginning of that class and the end of that class. Right. And that's it. So it's like, the, it's like at the beginning, seeing where they're coming in, right. and then afterwards. And then we do that with the going into winter. So we start at the beginning and then at the end. It's the same. Yeah. So in terms of, but it's a different group of students. Right, right. Yeah. So it's really like more test one, test two, because if we really waited to the beginning end, there would be some learning loss with some of them for sure, right? Right. Yeah, so, so it's yeah. a it's a way of assessing to see how much the kids are learning. And the second part, I think that's really important for the board to be aware of that we still have EML students in high schools. So part of reclassification is taking the star to help with that reclassification. So okay, and maybe related, and either of you can answer that question is where is the math data for secondary for, for high school? Like, there's, there's nothing about math, and so I'm not sure why. Uh, that would be a question. So I'd have to talk to Ms. Dr. Wilson, Sonia Wilson, okay. regarding that. Yeah. I'm, yeah. Okay. I'd, I'd like to know how our high school students are doing in math at student outcomes, right? Right. So that's a question I have. And my final thing is just LPAC. It's um, looking at that data is really interesting. I know that we looked at those arrows of students going up and students going down. Obviously, we have a population of students kind of coming into the program and out. Um, is there a way to show the data that with a stu are students reclassifying in the six-year thing that we have set out that's the standard? Um, you know, just kind of looking at our students that are with us for six years, it's just, I feel, I find that kind of hard to look at. There was just that area where it looked like some were successfully moving forward and some were not. Um, and just, I don't know. It's The graph it, didn't capture that. Yeah. Mm, how how do we is, capture there... that in a way that shows us that w where the issue is, right? Like you, you intimated that if they, the more years they are in the district, mm -hmm. they, the more likely they are to reclassify. Mm -hmm. Probably the younger, I think that's what you're mm -hmm. trying to say. Mm -hmm. That works better. I don't see that as much. And I, for me, it it's really trying to identify wh what we can do, if we can do anything at all. So it can be captured. And when our leaders look at their um, language acquisition data, they do look at it from a lens of especially elementary principals because they have them typically since kindergarten. Many of our students are. Um, EMLs because there is another language in the household and not necessarily because they come from a different country. So the majority of our, our reclassification rates are always have been higher in elementary for those reasons because we have them and by the fifth grade many of our students reclassify. That can be captured like the ones that start with us and have remained. We do sometimes lose them for a year or two they can move and that's harder to track when they are not consistent with us for 
um, you know, five consecutive years or six consecutive years, but there is a way to capture that. Yeah, and I think that's probably, for me, meaningful to see that, like where, you know, um, are, are we being successful? Maybe in some situations there's not much we can do, but mm -hmm. in the places where we can do things, once again, to have that linear, how are we doing as a district? Are we getting better at it? You know, and so. So there is yeah. a way to capture from the students that are with us mm -hmm. for five, six, seven years, yeah. what the rate would look like. Yeah. So are we are we successful mm -hmm. at what we're trying to do? That's yeah. yeah that. OK. I, I just want to add that um, in the last year and a half or so, we've been buying more curriculum for EML students um, that started I'm almost sure a year and a half ago, two years, and that's part of what was missing, is having the appropriate curriculum at all the different grade levels, elementary, all the way to 12th grade, and you know, for newcomer students, for kids who've been here for a long time, uh, for the little ones, and so on. So I think that, along with prior to the pandemic, the board had adopted a META plan, which was a way for this district to just address even the issues of emerging multilingual students and of course that given pandemic and everything that happened didn't necessarily go the way we wanted we did start uh, a dual immersion program because we know that students who are emls do better in a bilingual program where their primary language is used and we have very few students who are emails in that kind of a program really only one school so a very small percentage but there's Things that have started, I would say, you know, like maybe four or five years, right, or the year right before I, I got here, that were things like new programs, new curriculum, looking at instructional practice. I know that um, Ms. Dr. Martinez and, and York Shingle and Trish Polstra are talking about doing training on academic conversations and helping teachers learn how to help students produce language by giving them, you know, uh, sentence frames and teaching them how to hold an academic conversation, which is beyond the normal everyday language. So those are the kinds of things, but in, in the sense of, to your questions, all those things have to take root. And, and they've been slowly moving towards meeting the needs of this population. Right, and so what I'm speaking to is looking at linear data. So, you know, just as you will look at interventions, you're going to say, okay, this percentage was flat, we intervened, they went up, they went down. And so as a history, the historical nature of our district needs to be, what did we do? And what, how, what, how did that affect the percentages? So we just need to have, I think, as part of our outcomes data, what is our history? What have we intervened? Like the interventions for better or for worse, there are going to be some things that hopefully are going to make things look better. And so we're constantly sort of looking at our data. This is just simply data analysis, not just having data, but looking at what that data means and sort of saying, okay, good, not good, you know, and what can we do? Can we do something about this? So I think for me, when I look at these reports, I want a more data analysis and why things are not moving. And it can be just, it's a new curriculum, fine. But in two years, three years, that needle should be moving. If it's not moving, we have a problem. And I wouldn't want to hear at the end of three years, if the needle hasn't moved afterwards, well, you know, we never really got this off the ground. I'd like to hear during that whole time, are we having trouble? Are things going smoothly? You know, what's happening? You know, it could even just be that all the students, you know, everybody moved from Santa Barbara and we had a new group of students. Mm -hmm. We can't make the needle move because everybody changed. Mm -hmm. But that data needs to be captured. We have to know that we're doing things in a very intentional, scientific, analytical way. And when things aren't going the way we want to, make some more interventions. Yeah. One thing that I can add without elaborating too much is that when we are having conversations about growth and academic discourse or just language acquisition in general, one of the themes that keeps coming up in our different discussions with our ISSs, with our MTSS TOSAs, with our language and literacy coaches, in our directors and net services, is the need to infuse integrated ELD practices. So that is going to be a heavy lift that is going to take time for, for us to see the benefits of that. But I understand what you're saying. There's a lot of conversations that we have and a lot of various um, ways to address the need, and it's um, important to make those connections when we have these presentations.
Let me just add to the integrated ELD because a little more nuance than that. Integrated ELD means that every teacher at Santa Barbara Unified that has a student who's in EML needs to know language development practices. That's an added layer of expectation of teacher expertise. And that's what we have three people in the district to help with. Um, and that means all teachers are teachers of language. And when you look at secondary, it's language and content. So it's the language of that content area that they're developing, which is a double load for the teacher in terms of the teaching load, and then it's a double load for the students. So that speaks to how we program students and the curriculum that we do. So I, I, I do agree with the scientific approach. I think longitudinal data is what you're looking for. And I do, I do want to also say we don't have an in-house longitudinal data, data person. That's something that we definitely would need to think about and talk to or maybe even partner with UCSB statisticians that can help with doing some of that work for us because we do not have that expertise in-house. But I just want to call out the integrated ELD means we're shifting a whole system of people to understand language development plus content of that language, and that's integrated ELD, and that's another big, another big lift that we need to do as a school district. And I think that's that's what I'm speaking to. That's what everybody's speaking to is is what do you know? Is it professional learning? Is it more curriculum? You know, just having those data points saying what are we doing? You know, and this is what it's going to take. And then when I look at budget reports and they say, okay, we need to spend this much on professional learning for ELD, and I'm looking at data saying that we need to get to this point. I'm like, oh, okay. You know, that's just you know connecting the dots, right? And Everybody has to be able to connect the dots, anybody looking at that information. Board members, any additional comments? Um, thank you for the presentation. I know I missed a little bit of it, but I was able to do prep before the meeting. My questions are mostly about EMLs, staying on this topic. Um, so on slide 23, if we can bring it up. And I know uh, we've had this conversation a few times since um, I joined the board. And so each time I learn a little bit more. And so for, I believe it's the one with the arrows. Yes. Yep. Either of those. Um, so when you're talking about the blue arrows, students moving up the LPAC scale, is that from one year to the next? Mm -hmm. Because the test only happens once, right? Correct. So yes. uh, for the students, I'm wondering how closely does STAR testing mimic um, even the structure of what they all see in LPAC, right? Mm -hmm. Because if we can, because it's also about, they get LPAC once a year, it's also about the regimen of that <laughs> test taking and getting used to the way that they're asking questions or structuring questions. Does STAR testing mimic that? No. STAR is going to measure your literacy. Mm -hmm. So literacy and language development go side by side, but there are distinct skills. So as the language acquisition is accelerating or progressing, the literacy skills follow. Okay. But there are two distinct me measures. Okay. So are there other opportunities for us to um, simulate or emulate the, the um, LPAC testing verbiage questions that students are getting exposed to, right? So that they're not just seeing it, and I know they're not just seeing it once a year, but that they're throughout the year getting prepared for this one opportunity that they get mm -hmm. to move up the LPAC scale or test out. Because as we've seen in the data, that is the biggest impediment to students getting reclassified. So one of the, one of the uh, strategies that was used last year as a kind of like a pilot in a trial was to have LPAC chats mm -hmm. and have um, with that came with um, building the awareness of the children as early as third grade as far as their different domains and how they're doing. But that was coupled with a lot of activities for teachers to employ. Mm -hmm. This year, I made an intentional effort to go to all principals. We talked about the LP growth, 
and provided them the resources that Trisha had uh, compiled from the previous year and, and perfected them and, and, and enhanced them. And that was shared with teachers. The implementation of that was a lot higher because there was that one-on-one -on -one conversation with the administrator to internalize the dashboard, to internalize the LP growth, to internalize how these resources, coupled with many other things that they're already doing, uh, enhances and accelerates language acquisition. Um, that is something that we will continue to implement. And then as we do that, other things, other opportunities arise <clears throat> recently. Uh, currently, I would say, uh, our junior high teachers of language acquisition are going to pilot a platform that is specifically for language acquisition. It's a supplemental program. It doesn't supplant the core. It is only of like 15, 20 minutes, three times a week. And they're going to try to see if that is something that will resonate with their students. We already have that support in elementary. We have zeroed in on newcomers, but as we learn the effectiveness of the supplemental program, we would expand. The more that we are able to see um, the benefits of using that as a supplemental program, then that also follows. And that platform does align with language acquisition. Mm -hmm. it's, it's a similar platform to like a literacy platform, yeah. but it's for language acquisition. Okay, so that's very helpful. Um, for me and the um, oh man I, oh uh, so we have feeder districts right mm -hmm. are we collaborating with our feeder districts to align some of what we're doing here at SB Unified um, so that when students come in they're they're more prepared for our interventions at the junior high and high school level We have not met with the feeder districts, and I would have to check in on the data to see how many emails we're getting mm -hmm. out of the neighboring districts, like Goleta Union probably has a larger amount than the other uh, four. Yeah, I think that would but be yeah, helpful. We have not met with them to see what they're working on, and I don't even know if Debbie's... Uh, I, I don't even know if they have a position that's similar to Debbie's in their district, so I would have to look into that. Okay. Mm -hmm. I would encourage us yeah. to, to do that. I think that there could only be benefits to, to partnerships and communication like that. And then the last item that relates to EMLs is I remember Principal Naughton at one time showed me how he keeps track of all of his EML students mm -hmm. and where they are in the reclassification process. Mm -hmm. And he explained to me how important it is for reclassification to take place by the end of sixth grade Mm -hmm. because of the fact that you're dealing with a much smaller population versus when you go to junior high or in high school trying to handle that many EML students for reclassification. Are we using that same practice across all of our elementaries? Can you speak to that about what efforts we're making to make sure that as many students as possible are reclassified by the end of sixth grade? So yes, and that was also implemented during Dr. Maldonado's leadership. I think the only tweak to that is to uniform um, a consistency so that it's uh, calendared as to when they're going to do that and throughout the year, which right now they, they do it when they're doing their MTSS reviews, when they're, every site is, has their, its own system. So uniforming that so that there's a calendar of when they're doing that. And that's coupled with um, we are to annually review every single EML that is part of our you know, um, responsibility and to formalize that and how we do that uh, moving forward. We do have a platform that helps us do that when it comes to streamlining that and capturing uh, the conversation of the team, the recommendations of the team. Think of it as an MTSS for EMLs, mm -hmm. but specifically for language acquisition. Obviously, academics as well and all the elements that contribute to the reclassification. But having this uh, process that will allow us to streamline the, pro the system and capture it so that we can look back from year to year and see when this annual review happened, what was the conversation like, what were some of the supports that were in place, 
Um, and then I think that will just help us maintain that rhythm of doing that, you know, X, X amount of year. We haven't decided like the frequency of that mm -hmm. yet, but that would be something that would be calendared moving the following year. Yeah, I appreciate that. Now it would be helpful for me and I'm sure the rest of the board to get an update on periodically, whether it's through these student outcomes updates, whether it's through um, other communications, um, or even school site visits, whatever it is, to get some sort of update about what we're doing across all of our elementary schools mm -hmm. and getting towards your vision for what the mm -hmm. annual evaluations. And yeah. um, so I would prefer, or I would have a preference for getting regular updates on, on that process. So we'll work with our school leaders mm -hmm. to get that coherence. We have found that it's better. We place the problem in their lap and say, here's what we're looking for, some coherence, some unity, let's define it together and let's set up a calendar. Works for me. So yeah, that'll happen and, and you'll probably hear more about it in the August meetings because we take the summer to do some of that coherence making and calendar building. Perfect. Thank you so much. And then uh, just an encouragement for us to um, work with UCSB because I think there is a partnership there to be had for some of the long longitudinal data that we have, we have all this data, and it'd be great to have a partner for the analysis side. I will reach out to Dr. Milam in the School of Ed um, and see if, if he has someone in his department or can refer me to maybe the math department that, or is it the engineer? Anyway, I'll figure out, start there and see if we can get some statistician support. Thank you. They're in the Department of Cognitive Science. Um, they're our educational Your Your Thank you. Thank you. In the Department of Cognitive Science, there are actually educational specialists who specialize in data analysis um, because that is a combination of you know psychology and neuroscience and and actually data analysis so that might be the place we um, actually end up at a couple a couple of questions first of all we 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 understand that the star as an interim assessment was chosen because it has a expected alignment and predictability on the CASP testing. Do we have evidence that our our star growth is being reflected in the CASP results? Is that that again? It's more data I'm asking about, but but that was to me part of the sales point of of star mm -hmm. or any any interim test. Are we seeing that? Should we look at what we're seeing there and then say, well, that's probably a good uh, a good expectation of what's going to be happening? Do we know that yet, how well it is aligned for us? We do not have that information as we speak right now, but I could definitely work with yes. Mr. Vince on gathering that information. <laughs> so we actually, we've, we did that analysis uh, a couple of years ago. Okay. So, um, and we know that it's a pretty good indicator. However, as you know, is um, it's important to get that data because we want to use that as a formative tool, so we can actually drill down into the, like the tier two support and actually tier one support. Yeah. 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 And, and the other question is, um, you know, when I was when I was. Um, in the last couple of years of my superintendency in Goleta, we were doing, we began doing the learning walks. We were referring to it as instructional rounds at that point. Um, do, do we have, um, uh, how, how do we know if what we're doing at those walks are, are, are effective? Is there some sort of a data, data point that we can look at and say this is, this is doing good for us? So currently, we are collecting qualitative data. Mm -hmm. We are looking at areas of strength. So our principals and their team, our leaders and their team, are identifying key areas that they would like to focus on. So if that key area is academic conversations, then that's what we are looking for within that class. And, and as we walk into classes, we're looking for that opportunity. We, we ask very quietly our questions of the students to really identify and then look at what we observe. Um, that information is then taken, that qualitative data is taken, and the sites are to develop a plan based on the strengths and the opportunities. And when we do round two, we're going to use that data to drive those next set of rounds. Um, and so right now we're looking at that qualitative data. We are looking at implementing a few other um, 
data points as we look at DigiCoach and things of that sort so we can start collecting some more data, as well as our school sites implementing their own learning walks as a site so that that can inform their instruction and they can do that with their teachers. So, so ultimately, the, the measurement beyond the qualitative data is, are we seeing the growth in the student outcomes that we're looking at across the system, and is that part of it? So, um, right. That, it's, it's good work that you're doing. I want to say thank you for the, the, the comprehensive uh, data that was gathered. Um, there's a lot more to learn. Right? Yeah, thank, thank you. Thank you. I believe we have one request to speak, correct? Yeah, we have one additional public commenter. Brianna Serrato. Welcome. Hello. Hi, board. Uh, thank you for taking the, the last minute public comment. Um, by my appearance, I was not planning on being here tonight since I have two sick kids at home. But um, uh, what I did come here for is a later item. Um, but for this one, I just wanted to um, let everybody know what's working really great at Roosevelt with the LPAC testing and the preparation for the testing. Uh, Principal Galindo has been working amazingly with our um, literacy coach, uh, Sonora Coronado, and also with our uh, family engagement liaison, Valeria Padilla. And instead of having the kiddos just go to rooms and do their testing, they're actually matching them up with trusted adult, adults on campus. So we have the various um, apologies, uh, Ananda and everybody on the your teacher term, um, but those that do power hour and that do the EML work with them, the yes, that. Um, so the, they match them up with ones that they are actually working with, that they have the rapport, that they have the relationship with, as well as with the staff administration and other staff members that can support the kiddos and can kind of tell, hey, do they look like they're kind of tired and maybe they need a little break and go run around or spin or maybe they need to take a snack versus just having them with a stranger who doesn't know, is this how they normally act when they are stressed, when they are already doing a test, things like that. So if that's not being done already at the other schools, highly recommend um, reaching out to Principal Galindo at Roosevelt to find out how exactly she's doing that and then pushing it out and because we have seen the success rate. Um, we also have a really strong LPAC or MLAC team, um, also led by Principal Galindo and Valeria Padilla, um, with a, a big strength um, with those parents in letting them know the importance of the reclassification. Because part of the re reason that it's really important that they do it prior to moving on to junior high is that that elective that they normally would get, they don't get the elective if they are having to, or if they're still a um, if they have not been, sorry, it's been a long day with kids and working at home. If they have not, thank you. If they have not reclassified um, by the time that they get to junior high, they then lose that elective period, which equity issue, as you guys all know. And that was it. Thank you so much. Thank you. I think that concludes our comments. Thank you for that. Um, so um, looks like we are asking for approval of the 2023 student outcomes report. But before I ask for that, I want to ask, uh, want to add the direction that the board has given with regards to more feedback, uh, what how, what that needs to look like, but, you know, uh, connecting the data from one report to the other, if we can put that in there as well, as well as direction to the superintendent to reach out to UCSB for a statistician, which looks like it's coming from the cognitive, cognitive science, science part department by our doctor on the board. Okay. So um, so we want to make sure we're keeping that direction um, as we're also seeking for approval of this report. May I have a motion for approval? It says approval. It says approval. So it's not approval? Okay. Just making sure, following what's on here. Even this late hour, I'm paying attention. Would y'all try to catch me off April fruit joke on April 5th? <laughs> It's exactly what it says. So, I was following it. so it was just a report. Okay, got it. <laughs> I do have a clarification question for the board with regards to the partnership with UCSB. Um, I'm hoping it'll be a free partnership, but if it isn't, I will be bringing that back to the board for consideration before we move forward. I know that in some cases with UCSB, we have had to incur costs. So I just want to make sure that I seeking clarity on your direction and we'll bring back that information when I do get it. Yes, we're seeking some um, free collaboration. Maybe yes. that's a student, you know, project. We, we, we already working on the budget, so we're looking at free. So, um, so thank you on that. So 
thank you, Dr. Sheffel, and those who also were a part of the, um, the reporting today. So Thank you. Okay. Board members, again, I want to continue with your self-care as we move to the action agenda, starting with uh, H1, the Student Discipline Education Code. Um, Mr. Escobedo, you would lead us off on that. A motion to approve Student Discipline Education Code 48918, case number 202324-19. 202324-22, 202324-24. We'll second the motion. Thank you. It's been motion and second. All in favor, please raise your hand and say aye. 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 Thank you. Motion passes. Next, we're moving to H2, approval of commission on teacher credentialing variable term requests. I see Ms. Peek walking to the board. Good evening, Board President Wendy Sims Mountain, Board of Education and Superintendent Dr. Maldonado. The item you have in front of you is a request to approve a variable term waiver request for two of our CTE or career technical education teachers. A variable term waiver is an option offered by the Commission on Teacher Credentialing to cover statewide shortage areas. It allows us as an employer to fill an assignment and is typically used when no other type of credential can be issued by the CTC. The item you have in front of you is for two fully credentialed CTE teachers who need an EL or English Learner Authorization Waiver. Oh, I'm sorry. Is this better? I don't have to start over, do I? Just pull it towards you. There, you go. there we go. So the item you have in front of you is for two fully credentialed CTE teachers who need an EL authorization waiver while clearing their credentials. So I am happy to answer any questions you may have. Any requests to speak on this item? Board members, any questions or comments? Hearing none, may I have a motion for approval? I move to approve the variable term waiver request. Do I hear a second? Second. Okay, been motion and second. All in favor, please raise your hands and say aye. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Peek. All right, we're moving to H3, approval of the human resources. Dr. Becchio is there. Okay. Good evening, Board President Sims Moten, Board members, Superintendent Maldonado. Um, on the action agenda, you have the human rec uh, resources recommendations. Would like to make just a couple highlights here. Um, we do want to recognize and congratulate um, Roxanne Garza, a kitchen lead Santa Barbara Junior High, 13 plus years service. She's retiring. She's on this list. Um, classified promotions, Yvonne Padilla, Mark Unzueta, and Susan um, Urbina Aguilera for their promotions in the classified um, workforce. And then if you go to the very bottom, or second page, I should say, middle, um, you will see that our entire list there of classified premium pay is advancements on the um, either adding service premium or increasing service premium for um, bilingual stipend. Um, I do want to add, though, Sean Sims at the bottom, Campus Safety at San Marcos, um, and he is... We are proposing we add the bachelor's degree stipend. So congratulations to Sean. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to you for consideration and approval. We have one request to speak. She speaks. <laughs> we have one speaker, Brianna Serrato. Thank you for catching it. <laughs> Hello again. Uh, this time I'll remember to introduce myself. I am Brianna Serrato. I am current parent um, of two kiddos in SB Unified. I am an alumni and I am on multiple committees and volunteer for SB Unified as well. So uh, I did not plan on being here today um, for public comment because uh, I have two sick kiddos at home. However, from watching YouTube, I really wanted to come and make sure that uh, I, um, I asked the board 
what is your policy and what are your procedures for all of these resignations that we're having? Uh, if you look at the, the letter, the list tonight, there's a ton of resignations across all different positions, not just teacher, which we can assume is because of salary and cost of living, um, but exit interviews. Do you do exit interviews? Does the district do exit interviews? That seems to be something that would be standard for any employer, but especially one that is having a hard time trying to retain positions to the point that they actually have staff paid to try to promote and recruit positions. So that seems to be an obvious starting point to kind of look at, okay, why are we not able to keep these staff? And also, are they trying to talk to them before they put in their resignation to see, can, is there anything that they can do to have them stay on so we don't have those vacancies because it, it's a huge ripple effect. But the big reason I'm here um, is I was really disappointed when I found out that uh, my former athletic trainer, Wendy Whitehead, from 23 years ago when I was on the football team at DP, that she had that tearful, heartfelt presentation earlier today. Uh, and when she was told that she, that Dr. Maldonado didn't have time for her and didn't have time for her over and over and over again to the point where she had to come here and hope that maybe that would give enough attention for her after 23 years of service. Um, so again, what's the district's policy? And is the board looking at these exit interviews? Uh, if not, why not? Uh, I recommend if the, the district's not doing exit interviews yet, you should be doing them. Also have anonymous um, submissions because people are concerned about retaliation, especially if they're trying to find a job somewhere else. Uh, but we have a resignation crisis and problem and, you know, with the, the regular public comments you guys hear of, they don't feel like there's any heart. They don't feel that they're being seen. Um, that with the Every Child Award and with a lot of the other things that it's about PR and uh, press photos, things like that. So please show your staff that you care and that you have the heart. Um, I know you were trying to, to speed things up earlier and, and there was no public, you guys didn't do your regular reports or make comments after the um, public comments period, but that was really disheartening that there wasn't even a mention that it would be looked into and uh, that they understood that, that you guys understood. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Dr. Beckhill, the two questions that um Ms. Brianna brought with regards to exit interview. Can you can you address that? No. Yes. Um, so we do do exit interviews through HR. So um, I do know that um, uh, Ms. Whitehead has requested an exit interview. That is done through HR. Um, and so I will uh, get a hold of her again to let her know that she can do that through HR. Um, as far as um, employee exit interviews, um, we we do do those, but I I do. Th I do think that one of the things that I'll work with staff on is the development of an anonymous survey exit staff or a survey exit interview that we can send out um, to employees. There's a there's there's a large number of employees that we manage, and so um, we we don't do individual exit interviews with everyone that resigns, but um, but I sending out a survey could be a great way to get um, some information from them. So I'll work on that with my staff. Was it, were those the two questions? Uh, yes, I think those are the two that, okay. with regards to that. But I, I will respond to with regards to the board. Oftentimes, it's part of uh, things are coming through public comment. And if it's not agendized, we cannot discuss it by Brown Act. Just to be fair for someone would have wanted to come if we were discussing that. So that kind of keeps us in, you know, in that kind of guideline. But um, it, it is something that we, if we can't do it publicly in that way, that we are given direction to staff to do that, as Dr. Becchio has come up and said that we're going to follow up that. And it's unfortunate that she was in, you know, such the state that she felt that she had to come to this board. Um, but sometimes we are restricted by that. It's by process and not by heart. So I just want to be clear about that, you know. And, and, and sometimes when we have to respond, it feels like we're, we're responding, defending ourselves. And that's not it. It's just the process to be fair, to make sure that everyone has the opportunity to appreciate but I, I appreciate your comments as well so board members any additional comments or questions okay thank you dr becchio with that may i entertain a motion for approval i moved i move to approve the human resources recommendations i second the motion to approve the human resource recommendations in motion is second may I, all in favor please raise your hand and say aye Hi. 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 
Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Becky. Okay, thank you. Okay. We're next moving to item H4, approval of California Department of Education Spain visiting teacher program. That's you, Dr. Yes. Becky. Um, so I'm bringing forward tonight for your consideration and approval um, of the visiting um, teacher program sponsored by the California De Department of Education and Spanish Ministry of Education. And this is a unique opportunity that um, not only the visiting teachers, but also our students and staff um, and community will experience. Um, the visiting teacher program partnership between California Department of Education and the Spain Ministry of Education dates back to, I believe it was year 2000. Um, the main focus of this program is the cultural and educational exchange um, between the people that are involved in the partnership. Um, and um, that happens between visiting teacher and the students, visiting teacher staff, and it actually happens in both directions. Um, and so um, those teachers will bring, um, the design of the program is for them to bring their, their, their full teaching Spanish language teachers in Spain. Um, to bring their expertise of the content and expertise of pedagogy from a completely different school system in Spain, um, as well as their cultural differences um, to our schools. But at the same time, what they're actually receiving is a benefit from working with our professionals, with our knowledge and expertise in our school system and, um, and our cultural differences that they will learn from and then um, take back with them to their regular jobs back in Spain. Um, as a side note, we happen to have um, a consistent need in this um, area of Spanish um, language. Um, these course offerings in Spanish are, are the most popular of our world language classes that um, satisfy the A through G requirements and we see increasing interest in them. Uh, for example, currently we anticipate a four probably a 4.0 FTE need next year, possibly more than that, but um, we're seeing 4.0 right now. Um, and um, the request here is that we, we're gonna interview and try to find two candidates. We, we may not be successful in that, um, but two candidates to participate in the visiting teacher program. Um, and uh, we'll have, uh, you know, we'll, um, Th these teachers, the design of it is, is they actually get, they are, they become Santa Barbara Unified School District teachers. We work through the California Department of Education on the credentialing, I mean, sorry, the CTC on the credentialing. We pay them um, their salary like we would a normal teacher. Um, they will um, be afforded the same benefits as a regular teacher. Well, um, their term would be um, three years maximum uh, with the opportunity to extend that to five years if if we applied for that so um, I believe those are the details I wanted to share with you and, and happy to answer any questions or that you might have a request to speak on this yep we have two public commenters the first is Allison Mendoza welcome is it on I think so. Hi. Um, my name is Allison Mendoza, um, and I have the unique opportunity to work on the translation and interpretation pathway that is part of our dual language immersion program at Santa Barbara High School. Um, after reviewing uh, the documents that were submitted, some colleagues and I had a few questions regarding this program. Um, the first question is, what are the additional costs uh, from this program? On the CDE website, it looks like most of their expenses will be reimbursed by the district. Um, it listed a used car, cell phone, and rent up to $3,000 um, on top of their salary. So I think we were a little confused about if that's something that the district is reimbursing or is that from the CDE website. Um, will these teachers be expected to obtain and clear a California teaching credential that was also listed on the website? Um, and what are their expectations for teaching alignment going to be? I know that there's that opportunity for that intercultural exchange, but knowing that we are also working on alignment um, as a department in our Spanish department, just curious how that, like what those expectations are. Um, also, will there be extra trainings provided to help these teachers navigate um, our, our community, our diverse student population, our like, linguistic diversity within Spanish, 
Um, and who would be expected to provide that? Um, and when would that be? Because I believe the document notes that their start date is the same as a new teacher. So I think about all the trainings that new teachers go through the first few days, setting up a classroom, um, just wanting to make sure that they have time to be fully prepared for that. I want to say that I really support our district getting creative to hire Spanish teachers um, and to fill the current vacancies that we have. I think we were under the impression there were six vacancies, um, not four. But I'm curious what we're doing to recruit long-term viable candidates. Um, some ideas I've seen include posting job listings on Spanish po uh, pedagogy Facebook groups, tabling at various Spanish language conferences that we already send people to, um, advertising to surrounding school districts, um, sending flyers. I know my parents got a flyer in their hometown, and I was like, oh, that's, I haven't seen that before. Um, and I'm curious if our current student teachers have been interviewed yet, because I know that we currently have three Spanish um, student teachers that are currently placed in our district. Um, I really believe that language classes can transform and expand and enrich our students' lives and can provide them a safe space and to hear their home language in an academic way can be really rewarding for a lot of students. So I think we were just looking for some clarity on some of those questions. Thank you. Thank you. Next is Travis Manyash. Welcome. Hello? Yep. All right. Thank you for, uh, for letting me speak. My name is Travis Manyash. I am a Spanish teacher at Santa Barbara High School um, and though I, I support the district um, finding creative solutions to address the major shortage of Spanish teachers across the entire district um, this is really just I believe a short term solution you know and, and I appreciate you guys highlighting this now just so that um, I can ask you what are we what are we doing how's the board speaking with the cabinet to address this when Dr. Becchio hired me 10 years ago, thank you, Dr. Becchio, um, the Spanish program was, was, wasn't thriving. We were losing kids to City College. They, they just weren't, their, their needs weren't being met and what they wanted out of the Spanish program. We now have, for next year, 540 students enrolled for Spanish 1, 2, and 3 at Santa Barbara High School. Um, but we don't, have, we don't have the people to teach. I taught four thirds. It's exhausting. Many of our teachers do it. It's not sustainable. Um, are we, we have students taking online Spanish, equivalent of uh, an online program for credit recovery. Uh, they're getting A through G credit for it, but those students, when I, when I see them, they're, they're, they're not up to speed or um, they're just, they, they lost interest in Spanish altogether. So are we going to continue to have online Spanish courses? We currently have city college teachers only teaching three days a week at school. They have two days a week where they're, they're not even in class. Um, and many of those students have IEPs which aren't being honored because they have to officially go through the city college process uh, and their program with the disability services to get any services at Santa Barbara High. We're basically just a satellite um, site for the city college. So um, again, I appreciate us finding these creative solutions and getting live body teachers but I think there's a bigger issue here we need to find a way to get more Spanish teachers this is A through G we really emphasize A through G I know Dr. Maldonado does um, and the kids deserve it so um, we've had UCSB students come into my classroom I've, I've mentored them they've gone off to other districts so um, I think school board a conversation with the cabinet about how, how are we going to attract and retain long-term teachers um, to meet the needs of our students, our department, our district? Um, so uh, I believe better pay and benefits would be a great place to start. Thank you. Thank you. That's the last public comment. Okay. Thank you. So board members, uh, comments and or questions regarding this? And then, no, no questions here. Dr. Becchio, so one of the, the speakers with regards to, can yeah. you can address some sure. of the couple questions? Sure, I, I did type really fast and okay. wrote down some questions. <laughs> so, um, great questions though. Um, the, I am not aware of the um, other expenses. Those, are, those expenses are paid for by the, the teachers coming. So there, there's an estimate that they're usually given of what it costs to live here. I'm not sure what, um, 
um, Ms. Mendoza was looking at on the CDE website, except to say that maybe that's a suggestion of what they're going to end up having to pay when they're here. Um, my understanding of, of the program, I went to a seminar about it, and it is um, really we're approaching this that we're hiring a teacher just like we would hire any other teacher. We do have to do some um, work with the CTC to get them fully credentialed, which we usually don't do um, that kind of intervention with a regular teacher from California, but we will, we will uh, help in that regard to make sure they're, they're rightfully credentialed. Um, they, we expect them to align with the curriculum and the, the good work that, that I know the departments, uh, world language departments have done in our district of, around alignment. We expect that as a teacher of ours, they will fall into line with that alignment. Um, and then, uh, let's see, we will be interviewing um, local candidates too. Those interviews are set. I, I don't have the date off the top of my head, but it's coming up. And Peak is here, but it's I think it's next week um, or the week after. Do you want to say something? Yeah. Um, and then let's see. I don't know if I. Co oh, they do um, actually. They're required to be here mid July. Um, the if we were to hire visiting teachers, they're required to be here for an orientation mid July um, with the um, program leaders. And then they also are required to um, be at our orientation like any other normal teacher would. However, um, it is highly recommended that we put together a plan of reception for the visiting teachers and extra orientation related to things that they might need to know. For example, showing them the community, showing them around the schools, um, the different schools, um, and things like that that we can do before the actual new teacher orientation. So um, myself and, and other staff will be putting together a plan for their reception and, and orientation to Santa Barbara and Santa Barbara Unified. Um, I think I covered most of them, if there's yeah. any. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Dr. Bill. So it it does say on this agreement that is between the Department of Education and the Spanish Ministry of Education that they will be reimbursed for their travel costs, for their visa costs, all that. So this is, seems like a boilerplate agreement. So I don't think it made it into the fiscal impact because maybe it, it's not the agreement. It's a, it's. Um, so are yeah. you? I. It's that piece of paper that that is like you know a contract. And it's Article, it's 2.12 um, that we, that um, the district will be, um, yeah, the, the, dis, the, um, the district charter will reimburse the visiting teacher as follows for direct costs incurred for travel and arrival to the school district charter school for the teaching assignment offered in the selection process, which includes processing fees for the J-1 non-immigrant visa, round-trip airline tickets, insurance, hotel, and rental deposits. And sorry, I'm trying to look for where you're at because I am not aware of any of those expenses. So Yeah, um, it's in that, it's that yeah. second, that first sheet. It's the, art, it's the actual I have general, Article 2, general provisions. Um, so you go down. I do know that's a clause if, if we release them, mm -hmm. that there's a, if we release them, before their contracts up, that there's a clause in there. Is that what you're referring to? It's just above Article Three, and it's 2.12. So it right. seems like the the provisions for re, for hiring them is to do all that. So if you just look above Article Three, it's the so 2.12. Yes. Correct. So if there's a dismissal for for any cause other than lack of professional skills, we do. There is a clause for reimbursement there. That's only if we dismiss them. Yeah. Right. Oh, okay. I, is that what you're, I know that piece is in there. I don't know if you were reading something else or. That's what I was reading. Yeah. I, I don't, I guess I didn't see the dismissal part. Okay. Because if you remember what the, the design of the yeah. contract is, um, we can't release a normal teacher from their contract mid-year. So this is kind of alluding to that. If, if oh, we're committing to hiring reasons. them, um, yeah. then we can't just dismiss them unless we um, reimburse them for those expenses. Okay. Okay. 
You scared me for a minute there. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I listened to ten intently in the workshop, and I didn't hear that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I just have a, a, go ahead. I just had a question with regards. So these two positions that we're requesting, these are unfilled positions, right? That are currently unfilled. Yeah, we're um, we're aware of four positions. Um, the the teachers might know better than than we if they have information we haven't heard yet about okay. additional positions. But okay. we do anticipate four full time positions. These, if again, we have to interview and find candidates that mm -hmm. we would want to hire. Yeah. These, this would be two of those already budgeted positions. Okay. Um, yeah, that we would have to hire someone for. Okay, so that's where the four and two came in because I was just looking at this. Is I think these on, are two we could get to make part of the four? Yeah, I think five. on this the description here I put. I think I even put there's a need for two FTEs, but there's actually a need. Yeah, that's. I mean, right. there's a need beyond that in our di across our district. There's a right. need for four plus. Exactly. So I've seen the two on this stuff, and then but as you were talking, you said four, maybe five, depending on you know. We won't be getting that from Spain though. We would right. So it would two. be. But of those four positions, you think we need two are unfilled right now and budgeted for, correct? Four are going to be four. Are, so four are, are unfilled for the, and for budgeted for. For August. For August. Yeah. But they are budgeted is what I'm yes. saying. Yes. That's, I want to be clear about that. We're not adding to the budget. No. So that's why I keep asking that These for are, clarity. What, what happens right now is, is that the principals and assistant principals are they're tallying their, their students' requests. Yeah, okay. So we can tell what it, and, and then we look at any kind of resignations, retirements. Right. Um, there are teachers doing four-fourths right now, um, a number of them. So those are still going to be students that, that want to take mm -hmm. next year or yeah. students we turned away this year because we didn't have the sections for them. Okay. So all that together, we're seeing a need for, for f at least four That's teachers. Four. Yeah. Okay. Just want to make sure we're clear mm -hmm. yep. on that, Doctor. I mean, hey, you yeah, doctor do tonight. Doctor. <laughs> doctor. Doctor. Um, no, all that information is really helpful. I think this is a, a neat opportunity for our school district. I do hear when we have folks saying we have these vacancies; they're really hard to recruit for. And so, I mean, some of the suggestions are are good ones about where we post for these jobs, where we recruit for these jobs. In my ideal world, we would be partnering with UCSB to get students that are getting their higher education here to keep them here. Um, it's something that I'm quite interested in. Mm -hmm. And I know we do have partnerships and other programs, but um, I think this is, albeit I, I hear the point about it being a short-term fix, but we do have a short-term need. And so this is up to five years is what I heard. If um, at the maximum of what we would be able to uh, hire this person for, is that right? Yeah. So um, you can you can engage in this. My understanding is you can engage in this program each year if we decide. Like if it's very successful on on the exchange part, those things go well. Um, we can engage in that each year with new candidates. Mm -hmm. That's my understanding. So, but these particular um, teachers would come and could do three years. And then a possibility of extending two more. Right. So with those, if we found good candidates Correct. and we are looking locally for yep. the vacancies as well. Yeah, I think there's no, um, there's not a downside to just adding this as an option. Mm -hmm. If we get all four or six teachers locally, even better, but this is an option as well. So I'm willing to make the motion to approve when appropriate. Okay, that's appropriate right now. All right. I will motion to approve the agreement for the California Department of Education Spain Visiting Teacher Program. Second. In motion is second. All in favor, please raise your hands and say aye. 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 Thank you. Thank motion you. passes. Just for some quick agenda management here, we're going to move to board members H7 okay. approval um, to open 30-day window for public inspection of AMPLA. Sorry. First, you told me I couldn't approve something. Now I know it's seven. I got a six. So, <laughs> okay, so we're gonna move to H six. So we're doing six and seven, and then five. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you very much for that. Um, we do have uh, a few of our ISSs that are here to address the board in regards to 
Uh, first for H6, our ethnic studies recommendation. And so I'm going to have um, two of our ISSs come up, and uh, they will be sharing information on this uh, approval that we're asking for. Thank you. Hi. Good evening, Good everyone. Good evening. Members of the board, <laughs> President Sims Moten, Morning. Superintendent Maldonado, uh, Art Nelson Concordia, ISS for Ethnic Studies. Alex Levesque, ISS for Social Studies. All right. Um, little flicker here. Awesome. All right, we'll just jump into it. So um, the two texts that were up for public review and that we're asking and recommending. Oh. Yeah, closer to the mic. All right. The two texts that were open for public inspection and that we're asking the board to, um, or recommending the board to adopt, are these two texts, Black History 365 and Give Me Liberty. These texts are going to be used in our ethnic study course offerings for Social Studies 11. That would be our History of Africans in America class and our Chicano Latino Studies class. Um, even before we opened up these texts for the 30-day public inspection, we had a team of teachers review these texts. This team consisted of eight teachers representing all three high schools and our alternative ed schools. And um, unanimously, the teachers were in support of um, recommending these texts for adoption. So if we can uh, just bring your attention back to two timelines, um, and specifically to the uh, April date recommendation to the board. So as, as a result of our findings from both our adoption committee work and feedback from um, the 30-day window, we are recommending that the board adopt these two texts, or two timelines. Um, So we made available Black History 365 and Give Me Liberty, both online and in person here at district office. Uh, generally, the feedback from our community survey was, for the most part, uh, positive. Uh, the majority of responses were in favor of adopting both texts. Um, there was a relief expressed that there was no anti-Semitic content um, the, there was one comment that expressed concern about BH 365 being, quote, agenda driven uh, by the publisher, unquote. Um, and that was essentially, I think, we captured the broad essence of, of the, the survey feedback. Uh, as far as reaching out to our community partners, um, we did do that per your um, uh, direction. Um, I think today uh, I was CC'd on an, an email from Miss um, Connie Alexander and NAACP, which was directed to, to the board, um, expressing their support for both texts. Um, but outside of, of that, actually there was one um, reflection regarding the need for greater gender um, uh, diversity in terms of the Black Studies uh, Development Committee. But outside of that, there, there was no, no no other concerns brought forth. Um, and just general, how can we support uh, both texts being passed was the sentiment from the number of community partners uh, we reached out to. Thank you for that. Oh. Are there any requests to speak? Okay. You got one more? Or are you done? That was your last we slide, have, right? We have oh, well, go for it. Finish. More. Finish. Yeah. Well, finish. Okay. Yeah, finish it out. <laughs> That's like I didn't see it. Like, where did it go? We can go to see it here. Anyway, yeah. A little bit more. Um, yeah. All right. I'm gonna be very uh, brief with this. Oh no then. worries. <laughs> it just didn't. It just went away. So that's why. Um, so we mentioned briefly we had our adoption committee. Um, so very quickly, I want to go over the process that teachers use to review these texts. Um, we asked teachers to evaluate them, looking at three different lenses, alignment with district priorities, alignment with the California state standards for Social Studies 11, mm -hmm. and alignment with the four cornerstones of ethnic studies. Um, again, we found that teachers rated both texts very highly. Here's just a brief snapshot of some of those ratings. We can see that on a scale of one to five, five being the strongest, no text was rated below a four on these different criteria. Um, additionally, we just wanted to 
um, give you some of the feedback that teachers gave us. So demonstrating their support for these texts, um, for Give Me Liberty. The majority of teachers strongly supported recommending it for adoption. Um, and we want to draw your attention to, oh, oh no. Sorry, to um, one quote in particular that we thought kind of captured the essence of, essence of why this text um, should be recommended for this course. Um, a teacher said, in this text, 11th grade social studies state standards are addressed through a people's lens. And I think, and the same for Black History 365, some uh, statements made uh, in relation to, to teacher um, feelings about it, and then if we could just draw your attention to the second one. The text includes uh, activities that support students in thinking critically about the black experience in the U.S., and includes units that addresses the positive social impact of, of black culture on greater U.S. culture. Um, and we wanted to give you a peek into the text. Um, I, it's very traditional in form, in terms of table of contents, um, unit overview, preview, recap, um, guiding questions and such. But it is different in that it's uh, ethnic studies focused and the essence of the content is very much aligned to, to in this case, centering um, black history, black experience um, in the United States. Um, similar with Give Me Liberty, a very traditional structure or format for the, the chapters, but again with text that really lends itself to teaching social studies within ethnic studies and a um, Chicano Latino studies lens. Uh, as far as monitoring our student learning and their progress uh, at, the, at the site level um, and the particular, specifically in the classrooms, um, lesson and unit assessments grounded in student reflection, formal writing assessments, presentations, uh, our work to support our teachers in regularly meeting, uh, centering student work as the basis for uh, planning, teaching, and learning. And then broadly, as um, uh, Dr. Sheffield shared, uh, we're engaged in some significant learning walks where um, site administration, um, uh, ISS team, um, and then of course, you're always invited, I think, to, to come and see what's happening in our, in, in our classrooms generally and, and specifically in our ethnic studies courses. Um, we welcome that feedback and um, yes, that's it. Um, we also put together an estimate for the cost for this adoption. So looking at the actual cost of just purchasing these textbooks and then the cost for ongoing teacher development and training regarding incorporating these texts into their courses. Um, combine both texts, we're looking at an estimated cost of six, around 62000 So yeah, with that, we um, rec make a recommendation to the board that um, we adopt formally these two textbooks for our courses. Thank you. Any requests to speak? He's shaking his head no. Comments or questions, board members? Comments. Well, thank you for the presentation, and I, I really think um, thank you for taking the input of the board as to how you get out there and get a little bit spreading out the um, the community input. I did have one question: Are students part of the input on the curriculum? I know they are reflecting once it's there, but are they on your um, curriculum committee? Is that um, something you might want to think about? Not for no. Is that something? Is is that is that a proper place for them to be in this? Is so something to think about. I'm just asking. I I, th I think po possibly. I think in terms of um, how our teachers piloted the text. Um, again, I think we center student learning, um, student work as a as a way to reflect on how it's landing and and yeah. how we can improve instruction. So in in that respect, students are always a part of. Um, course development. Well, I guess what I just want to expand on that question is that before we come here and present, how can they be on that forefront of that? Right. Because it's reflecting after we've approved for you to get it. 
right? right. So I'm just saying in the process, is it, and, I, and the question is, is it the proper place for them to be there? And if not, that's okay. And if it's better on this end, I'm just trying to figure out where do we get that student input right. um, on the beginning end. Um, I mean that they weren't. Uh, I don't. I don't know. I would say that it's not the proper place for them. I don't think it was a consideration in this process, that, okay. and that may be um, an oversight. Yeah, just something uh, to think learning. about. It's not a yeah. judgment call at all. Okay. I'm just thinking the more that we're able to get, out, particularly this. I'm not. You know, there's other curriculums we do We might want to do that on math. They might right. tell us something, because you know, they do have some good things. Yes. But I'm just saying, in terms of how do we get that feedback from them? Because I know the teachers have to do it, but there may be some insight that we're hearing from te uh, te uh, students how they're going to receive it might help in terms of how you're going to deliver it. That's all. That's why I'm saying there might be some option to do it. So not a judgment, just a just an insight of you know thinking about it to to, to have them in the forefront of that but that's did you have oh, yeah, okay <laughs> just I, I think are we asking if the students like like they find the um the, the literature in the book comprehensible and easy to follow like what what are we asking to be assessed I, i'm just asking in terms of process so you got a committee that looks at it for all these various reasons and i'm just saying because we have our student council you know our advisory but are they part of that process for even those things that you're suggesting, so. I would agree. I feel like we need to actually have a process for every phase of curriculum adoption, and it might be really kind of smaller in the piloting. Who are we asking? What are we looking at? And then all that. I, I agree, a process. Is yeah, maybe where does it fit? And you're going to know this, so I'm looking at you. Do That's just a question from this end. Mr. Escobedo. Just uh, express of gratitude for all the work that you do. It's really important work. And um, with these two textbooks in particular, I just want to say thank you for doing the community outreach and getting feedback from folks. It was quite impactful to hear about what mm -hmm. they thought about it because there was some um, deep comments about what we have been discussing here so long that we have um, this people's lens to history that is more nuanced, that talks about the difficult parts of our history. and. Uh, I think our students can grapple with our real history. One of the questions I had is about give me liberty. So the teacher feedback, there was one teacher that said they could not recommend this book. Did they give you any other qualitative information that explained why that it was? Um, so it was a little bit of a misunderstanding. They thought that when they were reading the books, they were reading it for the History of Africans in America course because it was on the same rating form. I see. OK, thank you so much. Um, and I do want to take you up on visiting and seeing this in action, whether that's a learning walk or just dropping by a course. I will let, let, uh, leave that up to you all to find where the most appropriate time to visit is, but I would love to see it. Thank you so much. And thank you for your continued support um, in developing this. I just have to say it's really in, in exciting, incredible, I think groundbreaking uh, as well. And Santa Barbara's at, at the forefront of um, figuring out what this looks like. So thank you. Yeah, I was just going to give you that shout out. Um, I was on the county panel. And we were with other districts, we're learning what uh, Santa Barbara's doing. So right. just kudos to what you guys are working with, Ethnic Studies. Kudos for stick, you know, sticking through it, because again, Santa Barbara's on the forefront leading this. And there were other larger districts there that hadn't even thought about it. I mean, they may have thought about it, but also understanding perhaps what environments they're in and how difficult it can be. But it also said, because we're kind of in some of that environment here. We, we think we're more liberal than we are sometimes. But I'm just going to say that. So I'm just saying it was a model to that, too, because some of the districts were in more conservative environments, but yet they realized it's something they want to do. But, you know, it's just a, a kudos to the ethnic studies team that are coming to do that and continue to forge that as well. Again, and, and, and sharing where it came from was from the community, and here we are right now doing that. So glad that we're on the forefront of that. So, um, with that, can we move with an approval? Yep. Uh, once I can find the recommendation. Yep. Uh, motion to adopt and approve the purchase of two textbooks, Black History 365, published by Black History 365 Education, and Give Me Liberty, published by W.W. W. Norton. I second the motion to adopt these materials. 
Okay, then motion and second. All in favor, please raise your hands and say aye. 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 Thank you. Thank you, motion approved. Thank you. We will move to H7, approval to open the 30-day window for public inspection of Amplify Desmos math instruction materials. And we are Dr. Shepard. Good evening again. <laughs> and so we have... Um, Ms. Janet, that will come in, our math instruction for specialist, to share information in regards to opening up the window, the 30-day window to review for our textbook adoption in secondary math. Greetings, board members and uh, Dr. Maldonado. Um, thank you for having me here tonight. Uh, my name is Janet Hollister. Um, this is my 36th year in the district. I've taught at Lacumber Junior High. I've taught at San Marcos High. High school, I've been the elementary math TOSA, and I am now the secondary math ISS. So I've been here around for a while. Um, so um, I appreciate the opportunity to update you on our um, on updating our math instructional materials. Um, this work has been d done over the course of more than a year by a thoughtful and reflective team of teachers. Um, these teachers have considered multiple perspectives as they tried to make decisions that will both advance student learning in um, mathematics as well as support the, diverse, the diversity of teachers' needs that we have in our district. Our secondary math staff includes math teachers and special education co-teachers, many newly hired math teachers, mid-career math teachers, and teachers with over 30 years of experience, um, as well as teachers with um, a, a host of different perspectives about the teaching and learning of mathematics. Um, I'm proud to say that we had a diverse team of teachers when we worked on this adoption process. Um, I don't know who's doing the slides, so next slide. Oh, I have this right here. Okay. Um, all right, so, so this is a graphic that shows the timeline of the, the work done by teachers to investigate and pilot and make a recommendation on the programs that best meets the needs of um, the students and teachers in Santa Barbara Unified. I think in your board report, it had a much more detailed list of the different phases that we went through from selecting materials to um, doing a book review and um, then piloting materials and ultimately making a decision. Okay, so I do this. Ha! All right, before we talk about the instructional materials that we chose, I just wanted to make sure that we're all on the same page about what's happening in the world of math education. Um, in 2023, the state of California adopted the Common Core State Standards for Mathematics. We've always had content standards, but at that moment in time, we added these things called the Standards for Mathematical Practice, and those are the ways in which you engage with mathematics. It's not just you can add fractions. So um, some of these math practices are very easy to understand, and they're things like make, make sense of problems and persevere in solving them. Okay, or construct a viable argument and critique the reasoning of others. And just when I say those things, you can hear the language demands in the ways of working in math. So I was listening to Dr. Maldonado earlier talk about integrated ELD and academic literacy, developing academic literacy. And so the standards for mathematical practice ask students to read, to access complex text. They ask them to, to create viable arguments and, and um, write about their mathematical thinking. And so one of the shifts in 2023 was introducing those standards for mathematical practice that ask students to engage with mathematics in a deeper way. And that was, that was and still is, hard for us to think about math in that way. Um, there's other math practices that we're still working on trying to get better at, but there's eight standards for mathematical practice. Um, the other thing that I want to bring up is that in, 20, in the, in the um, 2023 math framework that was just published um, a little less than a year ago, they introduced these things called drivers of investigation. And so not only are there, is the state of California describing how students should be engaging with math, as, aside from just listening to a bunch of procedures and regurgitating answers, um, students, these drivers of investigation ask students to engage in mathematics that makes sense of the world, to use math to make sense of the world, to use math to predict what could happen, and to use math to figure out how we can impact the future. And these drivers of investigation are really a new thing that we're also going to have to contend with. So it's not the same mathematics that you experienced in school. It is content, it is practices, and it is these drivers of investigation that really bring a, a reason for learning math. 
Um, so we investigated four programs. Um, one of them over the course of the summer we found did not have adequate support for supporting multilingual students, and so we removed that one from consideration. Um, uh, President Sims Moten, you asked about student um, feedback in the process, and one of the things that I am very proud to say is that we asked for the three remaining programs in our pilot, we asked students, what did you think about this program? How did this go for you? And so we had five, over 500 students give us feedback on one, so on the program that we chose, we had 500 students. On another program, we had 200 students, and on another program, we had about 35, one class. And so we really said, this can't just be about what teachers want. We have to see, M math is having a tough enough time, as y'all saw. We're having a tough enough time as it is right now. If we choose things that, t that don't excite students, then we're just gonna continue to push this heavy boulder uphill. And so we need to make sure that we have teachers that are um, in support of this. And we, we had um, 22 teachers over the, over the spanning all of our um, different schools engage in committee work. We had 17 teachers give pilot feedback. We had more teachers pilot the materials. Um, some people didn't feel like filling out the feedback form or miss the deadline or something like that, but we had more than 17 teachers piloting. So we had a, a, a wide cross-section of people trying out the materials, getting feedback from both teachers and students. So I'm really excited to say that we chose to go with Amplify Math. Um, Amplify Math is a, pro Amplify Desmos Math is a, prob is a structured problem-based um, hybrid set of instructional materials. Um, you know, the reasons that teachers selected Amplify Desmos um, was the, the structured problem-based learning. The structures can be seen in the lesson and the unit design um, with features that embed supports for language development as well as the additional su this, the support needed um, additionally for students with IEPs and other needs in addition to having are you ready for more type of challenge problems. Um, the program thoughtfully considers conceptual understanding, procedural fluency, and application. It motivates students by using interesting problems as we get at those drivers of investigation. Um, the program provides teachers with a clear step-by-step -step moves to build systematically from what students' prior knowledge was to the grade level expectations. Um, I think the standards of math practice are hard enough to, to figure out how to integrate them. The instructional materials have routines built into them so that they can help teachers, help students engage in those practices. So if our math practice one is make sense of problems and persevere in solving them, there's an instructional routine called notice and wonder that helps, people, that helps students to look at an image or a graph or an equation or a problem and really think about what they know to be able to start to dig in and, and make sense of what's going on. We need to build that internal capacity in students so that we're not just always providing them what the steps are. We need to develop critical thinkers. So the Amplify Desmos has um, built in routines. They have built in math language routines and we've been working with UCSB on those for a while. So it really felt like there was some synergy in the work that we had been doing. Um, Amplify Desmos is a hybrid experience. There are opportunities for students to work online in dynamic ways to watch. When I put more weights on this, what happens? Or when I write this equation, what happens to the graph? It, it, there's a dy dynamic um, opportunity there. But there's also a paper lesson for every for every electronic lesson, there is a paper lesson also available. So we really grappled with the demands of tech on all of our workforce. And there are some people that were concerned that some of our teachers might struggle <laughs> with technology. And how do we support everybody, both teachers and students, to engage in, in this and have sort of that multiple means of engagement of both paper and technology. Um, 
students loved it. I, I, I really wanted to put some quotes from the kids up here because the quotes were amazing. It was hands down the favorite. Kids were so excited. Like the responsive feedback was great. They have opportunities where they can type their response and then it'll show three different kids' responses and you can kind of steal language from somebody else to be able to improve your explanation. So uh, the, the feedback from kids, it, it, they loved it. It was, um, it was amazing. We, we do have some pilots that are still going on. So if you wind up at a learning walk in a junior high, the Math 7 team at a few schools are, are just really working with the language in this. It's, it's super. The, 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 lang the math language routines are pairing up with our work at UCSB around math language routines, and it's, it was wonderful. Um, so with that, we are requesting um, to open a 30-day window for public inspection for the Amplify Desmos math curriculum. And I wonder what questions you have. <laughs> any requests to speak on this item? OK. I see, Dr. Bill, your hand is up for any questions. OK. So math seems to me um, a little more complicated than other curricula because it looks like you're going from junior high to high school for this. Um, and so, oh, I was just saying that they're, it's more complicated than other types of curricula. So we had heard with the physics curricula that it's kind of like ninth, 10th grade. And then if students have kind of a more math-based uh, approach to physics, they could go to the AP Physics 1, 2. Um, how does this curricula encompass advanced math students? And that's related to that maybe compaction. Maybe it's been too long and that no longer is there. And how about students with literacy issues? Because um, we're kind of at that breaking point right. with those students. So when we looked at instructional materials, there were um, three guideposts that, that I was directed to follow. One is that we needed to make sure that the, the materials were fully, fully standards aligned. Our current seventh grade materials are not. And so that was really important that we make sure that those check out. Um, I was, we want to have a cohesive program from junior high to high school. Um, we tried last time to get six, seven, and eight in alignment, and that didn't work out so much. But for a student experience, we wanted to have that. And um, the other one was EMLs. So as we looked at these programs, the Amplify Desmos that we have for the compaction that is in junior high, um, this program has a Math 7 curriculum, a Math 8 curriculum. It also has a program that is combines the 7th and 8th grade into an acceler. It's called 7th grade acceleration. Okay. And so in the junior high school play space, there is a 7th grade accelerated program, um, which is really going to support our teachers because our current materials, they do have an accelerated version, but not quite as formal and it's, it's and structured. Um, compaction in high school is not something that is generally done. It, it was sort of something that we did. It was sort of in the last California math framework, and we do have to think about what that looks like. We are going for a f slow rollout. We want to make sure that we get our junior high schools done and solid because this is relying on technology more than it has in the past. We want to make sure that we have the capacity and that we know how this is going to work before we try to ramp things up. So we will do seven and eight next year, maybe moving into math one before we go into the, high, the, the upper levels. And so there is a standing question about what we do with math two, three, and three pre-calc. And so we're going to go slow to be strong. And so, so the other thing about advanced learning, the, these materials have supports for EMLs, supports okay. for students with um, learning differences. It's sort of, they're universally designed. But they also have built in, are you ready for more opportunities? And so as a student is going through, and it doesn't say, you're in honors, you do this. It is when you get to this point in time, are you ready to take on an additional challenge? And so it, that is built in. I don't think it's built into every lesson, but it might be built into every two or three lessons. And so that if a student or a group of students wants to stretch themselves in a way, it is embedded within the material so a teacher's not having to look for the extension. It's within the course. OK. Um, OK, so I'm glad to hear you're rolling it out. Like We just yeah. have to go slow <laughs> because we have yeah. a lot of work to do. But like we, we really do have a lot of work to do from data gathering to assessment to interventions. And so let's 
do this well. And I know we're just opening up the 30-day window to look at this curriculum, but also keeping in mind, we talked about a process for that and then a process for the next step, which is, you know, when we're, so we pilot it first, yeah? In we seventh piloted in the fall. Okay, yeah. and both seventh and eighth grade. Okay, right. and we're going to try to figure out how to do feedback in the process. We did, we, we got the feedback. Oh, you got Yeah, we, they were we already did. in here in this one. <laughs> oh, we got, yeah. right. Okay. We did it. We, yeah. we, 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 and the 500 we, students, right. You're I'm yes. late. So, <laughs> My brain is a little behind. I understand. Okay. <laughs> right. Okay. So, so, so that's, okay, good. So there is that process and I guess we'll just get it verbally for now. You know, that like, I wouldn't mind saying 500 students, you know, as part of the report. Can you just, clarify your request? Oh, so my request is is to have that be part of what we look at because I look at these things before a board meeting. So I, you know, I wouldn't mind knowing ahead of, I have, a lot fewer questions if it said, you know, we talked to 500 students and, you know, they, 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 they liked it, they picked this, that sort of extra information, right? Yeah, kind of, yes, we get those great board memos. I love those. Those, those actually give me a little bit of insight into what I'm actually looking at. So, so that, and then the rollout process. I think those were my only questions. Okay. Mr. Escobedo. Kudos. This is a lot. It was really yeah. hard. <laughs> <laughs> and you got a whole lot of feedback. This is really impressive. The number of teachers, the number of students, the pilot programs. If there are still currently pilot programs going on, I would be interested in seeing it if you didn't think that that would get in the way of. We have two, three at La Cumbra, Santa Barbara Junior High, and La Colina. The seventh grade teams there said, we don't want to stop. We just want to keep going. Yeah. And so they just kept going. And so um, in the seventh grade space, that would be, it would be really fun. Like, it's kind of a brag. I mean, yeah. I, I just, I just want to celebrate those teachers who yeah. took on something really hard. And the really fascinating thing is that they're doing it together. Mm -hmm. And they want to meet up and they want to talk about, so for compaction, compaction goes fine. You know what, you just grab the stuff and you run and you teach it. But for other classes, you really have to think about that ramp and what's going on. And so they're just really asking for that time to sit down and really dig into unit planning and figuring out how to help kids get on that ramp. So fabulous group of teachers. Absolutely. Yeah. Again, so, thank yeah. you for everyone yeah. that was involved that took this on. Um, thank you for yeah. all of your service to the school district as well and taking on this big project. <laughs> yeah. um, Dr. Sheffield, as always. And my request, I'm going to be explicit about my request, if, you, if we can schedule a time to visit um, between now and the end of the school year, mm -hmm. I'll I let actually, you all decide. I'm going to plug you in when I go with Sunita. Perfect. Because we're doing Wednesday, so I will make sure Sandra adds you to that and okay. hope you can make that. That's I can tell you which classes that you want to go visit. Thank you so, so much. I'll do it on yeah. different days so there's not three of us together. Oh, are you coming too? I, hey, oh, I'm yeah. just saying. <laughs> Come on, Matt. <laughs> I'm just saying. Matt needs some love. Uh, this is, We're this going is, on tour, everybody. <laughs> this is some exciting stuff because I'm just yeah. going to tell you. I mean, I'm already thinking like, okay, so how do we start to engage the brain at the younger ages at this, whatever that level starts to be. So when they get there, because that was one of the questions that she was asking, like, Making math differently than what, you know, doing it differently the way we've been doing it. It's about numbers, and so that's where you can memorize those things, maybe. But when you start to introduce the reading part of it, it gets to, you know, because I did not like the storybook, you know, like two trains meeting on A and B. I didn't like that. But, but you know, I'm just saying, but if you're teaching it a di different way and you get enthusiastic about it, like I just got a little bit more enthusiasm about it. Let me go see what that's about, right? You have problems that aren't about trains, but right. things that you can But no, but I'm just saying, you saying what I'm saying, if yeah. we were perhaps looking at it that way, way, mm -hmm. then I wouldn't have been so frustrated about A or B as long as they didn't meet together, right? So, but I'm just saying, I just can appreciate where this is, and I'm and yep. hoping that this is, again, gets uh, our students, you know, excited about it, because yep. I, 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 we were doing a um, graduation, and one of the students, she talked about this, and I will never forget, she, how she loved math, because it always has a solution, and so how do you incorporate that? Because sometimes you look at math and you've already got some phobia behind it, right? But if we introduce it differently, I think mm -hmm. we can do that. And you have some old folks in there getting excited about it. Can you imagine what the students might do? Yep, so, yep, yep, yep. Math yep. can be joyful. It can be. <laughs> <laughs> I promise it can be. It can. I, I'm with you on that. So with that, uh, enthusiastically, can I get a, a, a motion for approval? 
to open the 30 days. Yes, I will enthusiastically (laughs) motion to approve the opening of the 30-day window for public instruction for the proposed recommended Amplified Desmos math and structural instructional instructional materials Mm -hmm. starting on (laughs) April 10th, 2024. I am sorry. I second the motion. Okay, the motion is second. All in favor, please raise your hands and say aye. 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 All right. Thank you. Thank you so much. I want to commend Janet. She's been at this for several years. Yeah. And I know that it was a lot uh, to decide to do it also also very thoughtfully. Um, Her advice to us has been great. Thank you, Janet. Okay. All right, so now we'll move back, uh, board members, to H5. I got got, you, 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 you. Over there. Approval of contract for mobile serve. We're going to move back. Who's coming up there? Oh, you just here. all night tonight, Sheffield Show. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, the mobile serve, um, it is a software that we would like to use to help manage for our high school students that are uh, getting their community service hours. Our high school students are required to get 60 hours of community service, and it can be a um, arduous process of our students and the community service agencies that they're working with and keeping track and signing off on those hours. So this software will be used by our schools as well as being able to be used by the community service agency to get these hours in it and it will uh, reduce the load of our college and career counselors and our college and career techs so they can concentrate on a few other things and manage this a little bit better. So we're asking for your approval to use the software. Okay. I don't see any requests to speak. Okay, board member. Yes, I got you. I got you. I'm not going to forget you. I got you. I got to go through the process now, y'all. Okay. Dr. So Bill. question I have for you. Um, do the, how does this actually work? I'm looking at a cell phone on this picture. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And the student, obviously, they aren't going to be the people to enter the hours or do they have to get it? They do, and they get it confirmed. I mean, how? I'm just wondering how this technology works. And I'll tell you a little background behind this. <clears throat> um, my daughter Jaya, as her her Girl Scout Gold Award, developed a um, an app for students to contact um, the shelter, the animal shelters, in like probably about 30 of them, to ask to do community service. And so she wanted to get their app so she could connect them. And she had a really hard time getting the shelters to, to want to deal with the technology. Mm-hmm. So, you know, I, I'm just kind of curious about how this will interact with the outside community service agencies. Who uploads it? How does it get confirmed? I, I can't tell from kind of looking at this, just reading their, their stuff. It doesn't really say how that process really actually happens. And so what I'll have to do is I'll have to gather some additional information from um, my college and career coordinator, uh, Ms. Ulisa Garcia. We'll be able to gather that information and share that with you. I don't know the intricacies of that, but I'll definitely gather that information for you. I mean, if we're going to spend money on technology, it has to be something that will be used. Absolutely. And so, so are we asking to approve the purchase of this, or what are, what are we asking to do? We're asking to approve the purchase of the software so that we can go ahead and begin and begin to use it. Our plan is to to really work out the kinks and figure out how it works starting this semester so that we're ready to take this on. Uh, all schools, all students in high school can can do this. So we will be working with our college and career counselors and a few of our agencies to ensure they have a complete understanding of how this software works. So as we move forward, there's been a lot of research. We've been working on this for a few months now, Mm -hmm. um, getting this approved and working with our ETS department to ensure that this is something that we could definitely implement and use. Um, I do believe that uh, Julissa Garcia, my college and career coordinator, has a better understanding that, and she can explain a little bit more, and I can gather that detail and make sure we send that to you. Right, because, I mean, it... I'm just not sure how it's going to be used, right? It's like we've, you've done the research and it can work, but can it work? Um, so I, I'm just not getting that feedback right now to say I want to approve it. And um, another small but important thing for me is it says the budget course, the source is LCAP. And um, 
you know, this is technology and it's something that we would use with all the students. And I'm not really sure, it seems like a very small amount of money, $10,000, but I, I just don't feel that LCAP should have to finance a piece of technology that gets student hours, right? It's just, it's like saying that the iPads that we're gonna give to all the students should be financed through LCAP because it helps them do their courses. It's technology, so, so that's a separate issue, but I'm also just sort of like, is this actually gonna work? Are we gonna ten, spend $10,000 on something that they can actually record hours, get it approved and uploaded to the system? I totally understand that we need a better system than what we have now. I've gone through it with my children, a piece of paper, do they get recorded? Nobody knows the piece of paper gets lost, et cetera, et cetera. So I do think there has to be a better way to upload that information that saves time and saves human hours, right? So I'm getting the sense it does that, but can we actually use it? I, I trust and believe that, that with my college and career counselors and my college and career coordinator, has uh, done the research and they have definitely identified as this something that is going to support the students as well as the agencies that we work with. Um, like I said, they have been working on this for a few months, so it's not something that they picked up and said, Lynn, here, let's do this. They have worked very closely with our ETS department to ensure that it's something that our software could work with and how it would be uploaded and um, that homework has been done. Um, and and I do believe that it, it will be something that will benefit our students. Do I do have an answer? Okay. So um, in doing a little bit of research on this, it, the way it works is the, and this is my understanding, so I, I'm pretty sure that this is right, that the organizations themselves wouldn't even really have to get the app it's that it would get emailed to them and they would sign off on the hours. The student themselves is putting it in, the organization, how many hours they worked, what they did, and the organizations are populated into this uh, database. And so it's only, I'm assuming, approved organizations and right. they pick the organization, let's say it's the animal shelter. And they put their supervisor's name and whoever's supposed to sign off on it and the supervisor's email. They then send it to the supervisor for them to just open up the email, similar to DocuSign, similar to that, and they sign it off, approve the hours, and then that goes into the system saying, this student has uh, volunteered for this many hours. In, in, in my opinion, a far better system than uh, the paper system. Mm -hmm. I remember uh, even when I did volunteer hours, Trying to track someone down to even sign it is a pain. Um, so um, I, I think that answers at least one of your questions about how the system works, how the platform works. I think it's it looked generally easy to do from a computer. Most people um, are at least sufficient with email that I think that the threshold for organizations to participate in this is pretty low. Um, the question about funding, that's a separate one. So that answers my question, like how does the organization get this information? And so if they can just do a signature through a DocuSign type thing, this will be effective, right? It's, and so we just have to set up with the organizations who is gonna be the contact or, or something like that, how to get them into the system. So that answers my question, yes. And then just the funding one is a whole different thing. Any additional questions, board members? Um, uh, the additional question I had, which I didn't see, but maybe it has this, it, would students be able to search volunteer opportunities using this platform? Or is it this just uh, logging the hours? It's just logging the okay. hours, yes. Okay. And, and, so it, and the curiosity of what firms and what organizations they would work with, that is the information that the college and career counselor and career tech would be working with them on, identifying the correct place that they can receive their volunteer hours. Okay, and stu so students would theoretically have a list of organizations that would be approved and hopefully a part of the system um, through the career counselors. But let's say I'm a student and I find another organization, I could bring that to my counselor and say, hey, I would really like to do my volunteer hours with this organization. The career counselor would likely vet it. Yes. And then, uh, 
if appropriate, approve it. And that's what happens right now. Yeah. So that will con that process will continue. We do get a variety of different things that our students want to volunteer for. And okay. so they do have to approve that. And there are sometimes we, we can't approve certain items. Totally. Yeah. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. yeah, so generally, I'm, I'm on board with this. I, my question is, is, is the funding question too, two part. Is this an annual cost? Is this a one-time cost or is there maintenance costs involved in it? This, this would be an annual cost. So this, this particular contract would take us through next year. Um, our college and career uh, budget does include some LCAP funds and it's identified in key areas that we can spend that budget on. And this is the one area that, that in technology that we decided to spend that particular funding on. Okay, so, that, and is there a maintenance cost to it too? I mean, it's there, technology changes, so there's, there's just, not a maintenance there's cost. There's not a maintenance cost, okay. Because I, I was just thinking in terms of, of the funding piece is like, is this the best? I know we have a dedicated um, um, allocation for it, so yes. I know it's there in that sense, but I'm just wondering, is this a partnership we could do with Santa Barbara Ed Foundation? Because it's ongoing and it's annual. So it's just something to think about. Maybe this first year we look at LCAP costs is there, but maybe mm -hmm. the ongoing costs, we look at other, our partnerships through the foundation. Lots of people like to support that, and so maybe we can work with our uh, Santa Barbara Ed Foundation on that. So that's my thought about that. Okay. So board members, I hear the concerns and, and, and understand what you're saying, and, and the, the idea that we're buying something that benefits all when the LCAP is for some. That's always like a, a big concern with lots of things that we're doing. If, if the board agrees, maybe, and I'll ask Dr. Sheffield, can we do some more research and bring it back next month? Uh, maybe get some more information from the college and career counselors. I hear several things happening. One is there is this need to track hours and give credit. And then there's this other bigger need that you've mentioned that there might be another tool that actually collects the community partners and is a little bit more integrated. Um, that we can ask uh, back to the college and career counselors and to Hulisa, our, our college and career coordinator. We did have this discussion, you and I, yes. and we did. Uh, I did ask, you know, do we do something now in April, or do we wait to introduce new things in July? The college and career counselors did ask Dr. Sheffield to do it now because they wanted to try it out. So another thought could be that we go to the company and see if there's a pilot we could buy that's a, a smaller amount of money to just do the three months, you know, can you let us have some licenses for a bit, pilot it like we do with other math materials mm -hmm. or other things, and then bring it back. So there is this dance we're having to do here because there is a need and technology helps. And there's lots of needs in this area. I know that parents have told me how concerned they are about how difficult it is. So I'm open to both things happening, and we'll look to you for guidance. Mr. Escobedo. My opinion is, I mean, $10,000 is a lot to me, but like $10,000 to serve all of our high school students is, is not a huge expense. I think something that would be more appropriate is to say, let's approve the $10,000, but before it comes back for renewal, we want to see certain metrics about how successful it mm -hmm. is. And a reevaluation of, um, one, its usefulness and effectiveness, both for the community partners, but for also for our students and our college counselors, college and career counselors. And then um, the other piece is, are there other more appropriate areas for funding? Yes. Yes. We could look for other for other funding sources. So exactly. a report, in addition to that, looking at other funding opportunities. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. I think for me, I, I agree in, in terms of that, because just being mindful of where we are in our budget. And Absolutely. so thinking forward, this is the way we need to think about it, right? Going forward, how are we going to do things, again, for some versus for all. And, and so use our partnerships where we can use those opportunities. So if we can, as you suggested, pilot it just to make sure, um, you know, that's a part of being mindful of the dollars, even though it's a $10,000 amount. Is that a possibility? Uh, and, do, and will it delay the, the need to use it now, right? 
right by us asking you to go back and see if the company will be I will definitely to go. have to investigate that I don't okay. have yeah. the answer to that yes yeah and I I agree like with the funding thing um, I like the idea of asking Santa Barbara Education Foundation because they really like these community things that tie the students to the community and that seems like the better place to put it I think this for LCAP, you know, we're already getting all these requests to have everything yeah. under the sun mm -hmm. funded by LCAP. And so if somebody sees this, it seems like a tenuous connection, right? And so how do we justify not having other things that have tenuous connections to LCAP being funded by LCAP? So I think we need to be clear about that particular, you know, type of funding that we, that it's not a one-time fund, it's an ongoing thing. So, yeah. Yeah. So do we want to take a vote, or would you like me to pull the item? I mean, either well, way. I, you know, it's, we're up for discussion. So what, what do you, we, we, it's on there for action and for motion, so. It, it's my understanding that this is the, we're still in the current LCAP. This would be an yes. expense for the current LCAP. I think my preference is we approve this contract, uh, the request for report and feedback on the effectiveness for all stakeholders, and then a report back on alternative funding sources, whether it's Santa Barbara Ed Foundation. That one's not my favorite because for ongoing costs, it is not always the most reliable to rely on foundations for ongoing costs, um, albeit $10,000 probably can be covered. Um, but I think it gives a whole year to come up with alternatives for funding sources. Yeah, and I, and I would just further, I think that the Santa Barbara Ed Foundation, they are for us, who, for what our needs are, and they ask oh, totally. for us. So that's a part of a conversation that we could have, and I don't think it would be too tenuous on them to ask, this is an ongoing cost here, and this is, you know, they ask, what do you need funding? And so they do that specifically for that. The funders who come and want, they have a specific thing that they're doing and not always just for general. So I think it's a good thing to, to you know, also... Um, request that as part of a conversation talking to the ed with regards to that i'm i'm not ready to say we do the ten thousand before we go back to this company and ask can we do for a pilot for half of that and we because we're coming back april 23rd right so can we do that and do those different things come back here um 20 to the 23rd that's 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 my thought on that i could definitely go back and get some more information okay but other other board members please I'm I'm just wondering, even if you said yes today, is it something that's even going to be in place and usable before the end of the year? If you wait till the end of April, you got to get the invoices done. You got to get this. You got to get the software. Got to get it installed. It's going to be May June. I don't know that, that you're realistic in any way to to do it this year. Um, mm. So it sounds like the pilot is is next year. There's another piece in here that you might pay attention to, which is a, a comment about. Um, the the co the annual subscription price is thirteen thousand dollars, and there's a discount of three thousand dollars. I don't know what what got that discount, and does that mean it's going to be thirteen thousand dollars in the second year? Mm -hmm. There's also a thing that says the uh, multi-year plans require upfront payment. So maybe if it works in the first year, you can say let's look at it for, you know, let's look at for several years. Can we get it for less by doing three or four or five at a time? And so that would be good. If we're going to bring it back, let's get the, all the information yeah. that might be helpful. So with that being said, board members, we want to table this um, motion to bring back for the 23rd, getting all the information that's, that, you know, buying the conversation that we're having right now. Do we want to table it and bring it back uh, for April 23rd to rediscuss it? Yes. Okay, may I have a motion to table it and to bring it back? I motion to table the mobile serve contract cost and uh, funding to the next meeting. Do I hear a second? second. I'll second. Okay. All right. <laughs> All in favor, raise your hand. Aye. 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 Okay. Motion passes. Thank you, board members. Thank you, Dr. Thank Shepard. you. Okay. She's still up here. Oh, you st oh, it is her show. <laughs> the eight, eight approval of the quarterly and complaints report. Here we go. So for our uh, Williams report, uh, uniform complaints, this is for um, 
the term January through March, and we're reporting it in April. Um, within that, if you could scroll up for me, um, we have had um, currently one report in the area of textbook and instructional, one, one complaint in the area of textbooks and instructional materials, and that uh, was resolved. There was a question in regards to our science curriculum at our uh, junior high schools, and we do have science curriculum at our junior high schools, and that has uh, been resolved. Okay. Not seeing any, thank you, Dr. Sheffield. I'm not seeing any requests to speak here. Okay. So, board members, any comments or questions? Okay, may I have a motion? Oh, do we have three? I move to accept the quarterly Williams Uniform Complaint Reports for Santa Barbara Unified School District for the period ending March 31st, 2023. Okay. I second the motion to accept the quarterly Williams report for this okay. period of time. Awesome. It's been motion and seconded. Um, can we, I'll just do a roll call because we have one member out. So, Dr. Bill? Yes. Aye. <laughs> Dr. Dr. Bill. Bill. I said, Dr. Bill, Dr. Mr. Bill, okay. <laughs> but I was talking to him. Oh, no. <laughs> well, Dr. Bill and Mr. Bill, okay. I get <laughs> See? <Our guy. laughs> and I say, I've pushed it past this 3 0. Okay. <laughs> we will move to H9. <laughs> oh, Mr. Desmond, okay. Approval of the loan documents from. S. Calrin's revolving savings fund to install LED lighting at Dos Pueblos. Here you well, go. Good evening, everybody. Good evening. I'll, uh, I'll try to keep this quick. Um, so thank you for your time. So the documents that you're looking at are for the LED lighting upgrades at Dos Pueblos and San Marcos High School. That was already board approved on September 26th of 2023. Um, the loan that we're approved for is a no interest loan from Southern California Regional Energy Re Network or SoCal REN. And this is called the Revolving Savings Fund, um, which is funded by the County of Los Angeles. Um, we decided to go with the SoCal REN program um, because they provided us with a $119,000 incentive to do the LED lighting at the, both schools. So that brings the loan and the project cost down to $855,000 for both schools combined. And this loan is going to be paid out in six-month chunks over the next five years. Um, and our energy savings as well as time savings from our staff um, is estimated to be equal to that of the loan amount. So with your approval of signing these loan documents, our contractor, uh, Vector Energy Group, will begin the retrofit of the LED lighting starting in May. We're anticipating that the bulk of the uh, project is going to be done over the summer, and uh, the entire project should be done by the end of September. So anytime that they're working in the schools, they're going to be, uh, while students are present, they're going to do uh, second shift, so after school hours, and then they basically work until, like, the nice custodians are done. Um, so, like I said, make it quick. So thank you for your time. And any questions? <laughs> I'm seeing no requests to speak from the public. Board members, do you have any questions? With that, quickly, can we get a motion for approval? <laughs> I move that we approve the signing of the loan documents from SoCal Rand's Revolving Savings Fund to install LED lighting at Dos Pueblos and San Marcos High School. Second. Motion and second. All in favor, please raise your hands and say aye. 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 Motion approved, so, so done. Thank, Thank you. you. Dr. Malinato? Yeah, I just want to remind the board that last year, and I know, Sunina, you weren't here, um, what I asked Cabinet to do last year is to bundle their contracts so that when we brought those forward to you, you would be able to see sort of the rhyme and reason for um, what Student Family Services doing, what Ed Services is doing, and so we're going to aim to do the same thing, you know, right around May again. So I just want to let the board know that we'll be bringing that again as a bundle where you're going to be asked to approve a set of contracts uh, as a group. Um, we will do our best to try to get you some thinking around what to anticipate that's coming forward. For example, I'm just going to keep using uh, Ms. Edison had Second step, ripple effects, panorama survey, and a set of contracts. She explained what each of them was for and how that was all together part of her department's work and so on. So I know we were a little off cycle with even the conversation we just had with Dr. Sheffield, but that will be part of how we're thinking about bringing contracts going forward to try to keep with that, that really, really good rhythm of introducing new things in July and, and so forth. Okay, thank you. 
Okay, so that brings us back to where there were no items to return for discussion. The coming events is April 12th is the end of the third quarter for junior high and high schools. They're probably saying yay. Um, and then obviously we will, the future agenda items, we can continue to look at those, but perhaps at our April 27th board, we can really start to nail that down and get them in, actually address those. So um, with that, I'd like to um, close this meeting and Till the next time we come together, which is Tuesday, April 23rd, 2024. All right. Thank you.